So just to introduce you, Zeynep moved to school in 2007 in biophysics and he studied uh, dynamics and interaction of nuclear proteins with uh, quantitative population microscopy. So Jude spoke of the uh, talk that uh, IMM uh, focused on applying quantitative microscopy methods to study mRNA biogenesis. And so since 2009, uh, Jose is the head of the bioimaging unit at IMM. Uh, in 2016, he was also appointed as head of the core cytometry unit. So he was responsible for both facilities and for the uh, 2020. And so now he's at the head of the bioimaging uh, facility at IMM. And so welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Good morning, everybody. First of all, I'm sorry it's the first time that I, I couldn't join you on Monday for giving for your flash talk. It was the IMM retreat on Monday and Tuesday. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for the, the invitation. And for those of you that don't know, this is the IMM. It's the building on, on the left. It's located in the Santa Maria uh, campus, right? uh, just uh, very close to the hospital. It's a place where we like to think that science meets medicine. So in the same campus, we have the IMM, the Faculty of Medicine, and the Hospital Santa Maria. I'm head of the bioimaging unit, which provide support for all light microscopy done in the Institute. You can see here one of the microscope rooms um, and the confocal right there uh, in the middle. And it happens often that people come in and ask us, uh, I want to use the confocal microscope. I want to learn the best uh, microscope that I can use. And let's see in this lecture uh, what, how a confocal microscope works and whether it is in fact the best uh, microscope. Okay, so, um, What's the problem with uh, wide field microscopy that you have heard about uh, yesterday? The problem is that um, when you look at things in a wide field microscope, you can see that there is a blur. You can see, uh, you try to focus, even if you use a large numerical aperture objective, you can see that there are parts of the image that are not in focus, that are blurred. And so um, this will degrade the image, of course. Now, I don't know if you have uh, uh, any interest in photography, um, but also in photographic cameras, uh, what happens is that there is a, a pupil diaphragm in front of, of the lens. And if you open uh, the diaphragm, if you open the pupil, if you use a lens with a high aperture, you can see that you have a very narrow depth of field. And so you can um, acquire images in which you have a very focused um, object, but everything else in the background is blurred. If you use an objective with a um, much lower aperture, and I'm sure David talked to you about the numerical aperture in objectives, you can see that you have a very extended uh, depth of a field. And so that everything in the image is in focus. You can, in your mobile phones, you can use this as portrait mode. And so if you, you know, on your camera, if you choose portrait mode, you see that the subject is very focused and everything around the background is blurred. Um, this is actually a trick. It's a gimmick that you have on your phone. It's not really opening a diaphragm on the lens. It's just using software to recognize the object and blurry the background. So the problem when you use a high numerical aperture objective, um, in a very high NI, you want to go for the highest uh, resolution. What happens is that um, you see you have a very narrow depth of field. You see things that are in focus, but anything above and, and below the plane of focus uh, will appear uh, blurred, like in here. If you use, if you use a very high uh, NI objective for a high resolution, you are the distance between the highest and lowest points in the sample uh, that will be in sharp focus is smaller than when using a low NI. So if you're using a, a 60x magnification, your depth of field, this is what we call the distance um, in the optical axis where you are able to produce a sharp focus, 
is around 400 nanometers. It's very, very thin. And so on the white field um, microscope, what happens is that you have your sample, and that's a, let's assume that your sample has only one um, tool core. You will be illuminating it with a very simplified version of a white field microscope. You'll be illuminating the entire field of view with white field illumination, all of this gets illuminated. You'll be capturing an image with an objective and the tube lens projecting on the image plane, on the camera, or on your eye. And so if your single flu four is on the focal plane of, of uh, the objective, it will produce a very sharp image on the detector. These are conjugate um, uh, planes. The problem is if it's a high numerical aperture objective and you have um, a flu four just above it, light will still be captured by the objective, but it will not be focused on the image plane of the camera. It will be focused a little bit above. So you'll see a defocused image of, of it. Whereas if it's underneath the focal plane, if it's a little below, um, you will, the light that will be captured by the objective will be focused before the image plane and then diverge again. So you'll see this blur. So if you have a single full for it's fine. If you have more of them, the light that will be captured with the white field will be a combination of all of these. Some in focus, some out of focus. And what you see, what you get with the white field microscope is not just the image of the focal plane where you get a very sharp focus. You also get light from above and below that will blur your image. You probably don't see this when you use a 10x, it's a very low numerical aperture objective because you have an extended depth of field. But when you use a higher numerical aperture objective, when you increase the resolution, your depth of field becomes smaller, you get blur from things that are uh, uh, above and below. So this is a problem. And it's a bigger problem when we look at thicker samples. So if we have just a layer of cells, if we have something very thin, it's fine. If we start looking at very large samples, at very thick samples, this will be more and more problematic. For a very, very, very thick sample, you might not be able, even able to see uh, anything. And this was the case for the brain. Um, you probably know Marvin Minsky, he's the inventor of the focal microscope. He's a computer scientist. You probably know him from artificial intelligence and big contributions. He, his father was an ophthalmologist, so he had a lot of lenses around the house when he was, he was young. He was used to uh, building things. He also wanted to learn how the neurons work, how the brain works. He could see the shapes of neurons in microscopes, but not how they were connected to each other on the brain. And so, uh, because of the limitation that you would see this big blur, of the brain is quite big with lots of, of cells. And so, um, his invention was um, the cofocal microscope. It, and the idea is that, you know, he wrote it in his memories that uh, the way to avoid all the scattered light was to never allow it to enter the detector in the first place. So, we would only want to see what's on the focal plane. So this is his patent, and what you see here is that uh, you have a, a, point, a, a light source, very intense light source that will be emitting light. On this side, it's the detector. This is the object here, and the idea is to uh, illuminate the object just in a single point through uh, a lens, through a pinhole. So if light goes through a pinhole, that it's like in the conjugate focal plane, as a, as a sample, and um, light will be focused just in the focal plane of the jet. Now, light that will be emitted by this plane will be captured either by a different objective or by the same objective, and it will go again through a pinhole before reaching the detector. So, by having the pinhole in a conjugate focal plane to the sample, the light that goes through this pinhole is focused here, and the light that's emitted by this point will be collected in the detector. Like that's focused in the other points will not go through it, that will be physically blocked by the, by the detector. 
Your physical obstruction is seeing what those of you who have lessons and sometimes came up with the captions on the on the TV, you tend to squint your eyes to have this. What you're doing, it's not for focal microscopy, but what you are doing is you're uh, narrowing into a small slit. And so you are filtering, you are only allowing the rays of light that can really perpendicular to your eyes to reach the retina. And those are less deviated than the ones that come at higher angles. And so you can see a little bit better for a few seconds, um, and your muscles cannot in that position. But this it's this physical separation of light, depending on whether it comes from, that also works uh, in a confocal uh, microscope. Marvin Minsky was inventor. He, uh, 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 he patented it. He built a prototype, uh, which he put in art as light source. The lasers were not very intense still at the time. The first true laser scanning confocal was developed by David Edgar and Paul Davidovitz. Um, so that, uh, in 1977, Colin Sherper and Shadori uh, wrote a theoretical analysis. He published a theoretical analysis on the, how these confocal microscopes would work. That's when uh, the term confocal microscope was first used. In 78, in Germany, Christoph Kramer and Thomas Kramer built the first practical confocal laser scanning microscope. So they were buying some images. Colin Shepard and Tony Wilson um, actually built a very interesting confocal microscope already with epilumination using the same objective. The stage was scanning, not the objectives, because in previous designs, it put the objectives that were moving. And they could also move along the Z axis. The Z axis. And in 1979, Fred Brackenfoff, he was actually the one in the publication that came up with the term confocal scanning light microscope. And he was the first to publish convincing biological images. So the confocal microscope, it's not the invention of, that we use today. It's not the invention of a single man. It has the contribution of many people in a similar period of time in different places and countries that were exploring the same idea. So Fred Brackenhoff used this confocal microscope in 1985. I had the pleasure of knowing him in, in Amsterdam. This was a confocal that uh, he used to acquire images. It looks a lot different. The, in the focus that we use today, you have all of these um, analog controls um, to control it. This is the first commercial confocal microscope, the BioRad MRC 500 in 1987. And you can compare with a confocal microscope today. <laughs> and this is one of the confocals that we have um, at, at IMM. There's been a, a huge advance in terms of of technology, a lot of things happen, like the graphic dyes, electronics, and that made the confocal microscope <laughs> the most versatile tool still today. I mean, the, the, as we've seen, there are a lot of imaging techniques developed in the last um, in the last years, breaking the barriers of resolution in space and time. The confocal microscope is still uh, the most used microscope in all imaging facilities that have a, a, a large scope of, of, of usage, I would, um, I would say. And, and let's see why, let's see how it happened. So um, the, Minsky's idea was to, you know, instead of illuminating the call sample, just focus on a single point in the focal plane. And so to do this, we don't use a pinhole for um, excitation. What we use is we expand the laser, we fill up the back focal plane of the objective, so we're focusing light on a single point in the cell. Light will be emitted in every direction. Part of it will be captured by the objective, and it will um, reach a detector. But before that, we have the pinhole. So the combination of illuminating with a single point and placing a pinhole just in front of the detector in a conjugate focal plane, that's what confocal means, conjugated focal plane, means that light that will be illuminated in a sample in a single point will go through the pinhole and fully reach the detector. If we have a flow floor above it that will emit light, this light will be focused a little bit above of the pinhole, so the vast majority of the light will be blocked by this by this pinhole and not reach the detector. If we have a present sample underneath a present molecule underneath it, it will um, be focused, the image of it will be focused just um, before the pinhole, it will diverge again and again. Uh, be filtered by the pinhole. So you need two things, not just the pinhole. Um, the pinhole will provide this exclusion, but you also need to um, illuminate just in a single point um, in the sample. 
And this works for a point. So how do you build an image out of a point? Um, so the detectors that we use in Pofo microscopy and that were used at the time and even variations today, they they capture a low amount of light because most of the light will be rejected by the pin So only a few photons reach the, the detector. Um, and it's a point detector, so it only detects light coming from a point, and it needs to be able to amplify uh, the, the photons that it receives into a signal that we can read, and it needs to do this very, very fast. Um, and this is the PMT, the photomultiplier tube. Um, it does not have any spatial discrimination, it's just able to uh, create electrons out of photons that hit the, phot that hit the photocathode. They will be um, uh, displacing electrons in the diamonds that will be accelerated towards consecutive diamonds. Each time you have um, um, an amplification signal, one electron generates two, then four, then uh, eight, then 16, then 32, and so on. And this depends on the voltage difference between these diamonds. So the higher the voltage, the higher the number of electrons that you can produce from a photon that is detected in the photocathode. And the higher the number of photons, the higher the current, the higher a signal, which will then be able to provide you with an intensity value um, on, on an image. Um, and so we can we can count, we can detect, we can generate uh, an electric signal from photons that come from a single point um, in the sample. Um, but how do we make an image? In order to make an image, we need to add scanning mirrors to the proposal. So we need to find a way to move this point in the sample. And this is done by a set of mirrors that move it in X and, and Y, so that the laser beam will be illuminating um, the sample at different uh, points. And uh, uh, because the PMT is very, very fast, we are able in, in a computer to count, to uh, convert the photons into electrons, into an intensity value corresponding to this point and this and this and this, and we'll display this in the computer screen as an, uh, an image. And so um, we will also be able to control the laser intensity very, very fast, point by point. Um, so we can actually say, illuminate this point with 10% intensity and the, ne the next one right next to it at 100% intensity. This is done by using a crystal and acoustic optical tunable filter um, that's able to um, vibrate, resonate at different frequencies, allowing more or less laser light to go through. So your laser is always emitting at 100% intensity. It's this crystal in front of it that will dictate how many of that light goes to the microscope. And again, we are able to do this very, very fast. So we have this um, the electronic components, the, the detector, the photomultiplier tube, the scanning mirrors, the AOPF, all working in the um, microsecond range to acquire, um, to scan an image, capture photons, controlling the intensity um, uh, uh, very, very um, precisely. And with this, we can acquire images, scanning images, of just the focal plane in the sample. Yes. Sorry, the, okay. the prior scheme. So the, the amount of scanning that you can make of your sample is not just dependent on the mirrors that you have in the system, but also of the how much of them, how much how higher NA you have or low yes, NA absolutely. You have on your object. I guess higher NA, the bigger scanning and X and Y that you have in your sample, or it's not proportional. So the higher NA will give you a higher resolution, the higher NA will give you a shallow depth of field, very, very thin. You'll be able to control how many points and what's the distance between the points in a field of view that's dictated by the objective um, uh, magnification. Um, and that's one of the main advantages of the confocal. Whereas, whereas on, a, on a camera system, you have a camera with a given resolution. You may have additional optics, opt of our elements to uh, uh, magnify or demagnify the image. On the confocal microscope, you can actually choose um, what's the uh, number of points that you scan in the sample and what's the distance uh, between them. And, and so you can you can you can move them uh, uh, 10 nanometers apart. The resolution, the optical resolution of the microscope will be dictated by the numerical aperture. So you'll be over in this case. The resolution is not higher than 200 nanometers, 
but you can set them to Nyquist to 100 nanometers. I'm sure David uh, told you about this. Or, uh, or you can space them further apart and acquire with a lower resolution, but much, much faster. This is one of the advantages of the Kofoko microscope by being able to control um, how the sample is scanned. You can choose between speed or uh, resolution. And the numerical aperture of the objective will also dictate how thin is the optical slice you can study, how thin is your depth. And you'll be able also to change the size of the pinhole to match. Yeah. Sorry. I didn't understand very well the, the, the advantage of the Gusto. The AOTF. Yes. Suppose that you, uh, well, uh, uh, we need to, we we'll always want to use as less light as possible, not to um, um, burn your sample, not to do photo bleaching. So you have on a, on a, um, on a white field microscope, you control the intensity of the lamp. Yeah. So, okay. So you can do also this with the laser. But instead of changing the current in the laser tube and having it uh, uh, emitting more or less laser light, it would be a slow process. Um, with the use of this element, the Gusto optic tunable filter, this crystal, you'll be able to do it on the um, microsecond uh, range. So you'll be able to change intensity of the laser very fast from 100 to 1% in just a few microseconds. So between one point and the other. So in the, in the system, like let's say in the the right the, the, the design microscope, the confocal, when you change the laser power, you are changing the You're not changing the laser power. If you move carefully, it's called transmission. Yes. It's the transmission through the acoustic optic tunable filter, not the laser power that you're changing. When you set it to 10% or 2%, it's the laser transmission mm -hmm. through the acoustic optical tunable filter. And usually you set it to, let's say, 2% or 4% to acquire a, an image of the sample. There are some cases where you want to use different laser, uh, 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 dif dif different laser intensity, different laser transmission, only in some parts of the sample. And we'll see in the second uh, lecture why, or why is that. But you can do that. So um, this is just a very fast way of changing the laser um, Transmission of changing the laser illumination power in the in the sample, but the laser is always emitting at hundred percent. So you're not, you know, you're not you're not prolonging the laser life by using it at ten percent transmission. You're just saving the sample from um, extra um, extra light. Um, okay, so we are able to acquire images from a focal um, plane, and this is. The main advantage of the confocal compared to the wide field, we are able to do optical sectioning. So we can just get light from a single um, uh, from a single focal plane. If we move the objective up and down relative to the sample, we'll be able to acquire different optical slices, like we're virtually slicing the sample, but just using um, physics, you know. So we call this we call this um, Z slices and the whole set of a Z, Z slice. So if you move the objective from a low point to a high point, we have a Z stack. That's what we call a Z stack. This is an example of a Z stack. This is a sample from William Roman. And we'll look at that in a, few, a few years ago at the, at the IMM. Um, this is Desmond staining a, a muscle of fiber. So you can see a single, um, a single slice, a single optical section of the sample. And when we move the objective up, you we get different op, different planes. We get the Z stack of different uh, uh, slices. If we saw the sample in the white field microscope, we probably just see a big blur. The muscle is quite thick. Uh, we wouldn't see certainly we wouldn't see the detail um, on on the muscle. Um, we can stack all of these um, uh, optical sections in the computer. We can generate different images projections. Um, uh, for different angles, and we have a 3D reconstruction of what the sample looks like. So, for focal microscopy, 3D microscopy. You can look at your, you can do Z stacks, you can do optical sectioning, and you can see your sample in, in 3D. You will not be able to do this on the wide field microscope. This alone was a big revolution in, uh, in, in microscopy. Okay, so. I told you that we can change the size of the pinhole. So which size should we should the pinhole have? I mean, if we have it fully open, 
you will not get any optical section. You will get all the light that comes from the sample. We are illuminating just in one point, but uh, we are also getting light from above and below. Uh, I'm sure you've heard about point spread function and the resolution of, of uh, a microscope, right? You know that the image, if we have a tiny dot, just a single molecule emitting fluorescence, the image of this point through an objective will not be a point. It will be a pattern of interference um, called the point spread function. This is what it looks like in X and Y, and there it is. And in 3D, it has its beautiful shape. Um, where you see patterns of light and shadow of interference caused by diffraction. You, you've seen this, right? So, um, what should be the size of the pupil? You can make it very, very, very small. So, if you want maximum resolution, perhaps it would be a good idea to get rid of these uh, patterns here. So, if we choose the pinhole aperture to be actually the size, of the there it is, and we can calculate precisely what that is. We call this one area unit, the opening of the pinhole, and you're just capturing the central part of the front spec function. So if you open the pinhole, you get um, more and more light coming, so the optical size will be increasing, increasing, and you get a blurred image. If you close it down, you gain resolution. This is the size of the um, of, of the points per function in Z. This is one area unit. You can continue to close it um, and gain further resolution a little bit more. So you can actually make it smaller. If you close it a little bit more, you are seeing a smaller point per function. So you gain um, so you gain resolution. Let me show you more detail what happens. If you do that, then you start to lose um, you start to lose signal. So one area unit is a sweet spot where you get um, uh, not that much of an improvement in the lateral resolution on the size of the PSF it is, but in the optical slice thickness in the size in Z, you see that you get much, much lower varies than when you are using the pinhole fully open in the white field, in the white field system. So as you close down the pinhole, your slice thickness decreases, you gain resolution in Z, if you, uh, without really losing a lot of, of, of light, if you close it further than one area unit, you gain a little bit more resolution in X, Y, and Z, but the signal starts to decrease a lot. If you close it down really to low values, you almost get no signal at all. Okay, so closing down the pinhole even further than one area unit is a way to increase resolution, but at the, at the expense of intensity of the signal. Notice, however, that around here is 0 0.6, more or less, you have uh, maybe 80% of loss, and you, see you have a sharp increase in lateral and axial resolution in X, Y, and Z. So um, you see that uh, many cofocals will actually allow you to do super resolution to go beyond the 200 nanometers by closing down the pinhole if they can detect the light coming from the sample, um, uh, which, is, uh, um, which, is, which is reduced. I will not go into the um, um, development in focal microscopy in, in going into super resolution. I'm pretty sure Tony Prague will tell you about this um, um, in the next talk. So I'll not be focusing on the iris scan detector or on, on different approaches to go for this. It's just the traditional uh, point scanning um, uh, confocal. Any questions so far? Yes. So um, when you put slice, do you see like the slice is the diffraction part of the pen is on the wavelength. Mm -hmm. So how does the light sweep the pinhole and how do you calculate? This is a very good question because this will absolutely depend on the wavelength. These are the values for um, uh, uh, for 96 nanometer um, uh, emission for green light. If you cite it, um, um, uh, for blue light, sorry. If you use a red full four, you're uh, in using the same pinhole aperture. Um, your um, uh, actually the size of the point spread function will depend on the wavelength. It will be bigger. Okay, so um, for for larger wavelengths. So um, using different pinhole sizes um, for different full four, this will be required to have the same optical size thickness. If you just use one area unit um, for um, 
for the full forest, you will have different um, optical size thicknesses because of the difference in the wavelength. So when you are, if you are, if you want to be absolutely sure that you have the same optical size thickness when using different full forest, you have to change um, the final aperture and look at the optical size thickness value to make sure that they match because the wavelength profile is in fact a parameter that affects the optical slice thickness because of the size of the point of the point spread function. Um, also, the numerical aperture of the objective and this goes towards your question um, affects the optical slice thickness. Okay, we saw that the depth of field for uh, lower magnification objectives um, is much is much much bigger, and so uh, using a, a high numerical aperture. Uh, objective, you'll be able to focus light in the point, and this is an XZ image of a 10 micrometer bead in a confocal microscope. You can see that you can uh, reconstitute the bead uh, um, height. But when you go lower on the numerical aperture, um, if you go lower on the magnification, your uh, point spread function becomes bigger and bigger. And even if you use a pinhole and even if you use uh, point illumination, you will not be able to get uh, such a well defined. Um, uh, optical size of your sample. So using a confocal microscope with a 10x 0.3 numerical aperture objective will not be that much different than using uh, a wide field. Okay, you only start to notice the uh, axial uh, resolution improvement when you image at 40 or 100 rays with a higher NI uh, 1.2, 1.4. And this is, of course, if you have a very, very, very big sample, we're talking about several um, under micrometers or millimeters, um, being able to produce optical slices of, of 500, 600 nanometers will still be uh, useful, but you don't have the same, um, um, the same detail. So you can change all of these parameters in the cofocal um, microscope, I told you. You can change the number of points, you can change the intensity of the laser, um, uh, you can adjust the voltage in your photo multiplier to generate more or less um, electrons. Um, doing the focal microscopy, um, there's the system doesn't have a button that says that says back temple for every um, location. Okay, you can you can drive it in many different ways. You can adjust the parameters for a very very high resolution, but then you lose on the sensitivity um, and speed because you need to illuminate with a lot of light and you need to scan um, slower. If you want to image very very fast and your uh, laser will be scanning the, the temple very, very fast, you, you probably not, will not collect enough photons to get a very high signal to noise uh, ratio. And uh, if you want to go faster, you have to scan less points. So there's an art in profocal imaging, uh, I call this a triangle of frustration, because you cannot get it all. You have to decide, depending on your application, whether you want resolution, speed, or um, sensitivity. And these are the parameters in the confocal microscope that you have to um, adjust. So on the resolution side, of course, you can change the, the image size in the zoom. You can define in the field of view of your objective what's the area that will be scanned and what's the number of points that will be scanning. Um, on the on the uh, on, on the mirrors that move the laser, you can specify how fast they move. So what's the scan speed? They can spend from um, uh, microseconds to uh, seconds on, a, on an image, you can you can choose that, and the number of images. So applying the confocal imaging can take anywhere from 100 milliseconds to, uh, um, to many, many seconds. And, and on the sensitivity side, you can play with the laser intensity, of course, but also with the detector, uh, with the detector gain. So depending on the application, we need to optimize these parameters to match our needs. If we want to look at intercellular tracking and go very fast, we go for speed. If we have a fixed sample and we want the highest resolution possible, such as that uh, muscle fiber, we may go for, for resolution. This is another example of another muscle fiber, but in this case, uh, with um, uh, three different stainings, that before nuclei, desmin, and, and tubulin. And when we do the 3D projection, uh, almost fully optimized, this is very close to what you can get um, for, with a higher numerical aperture objective, 63x, 1.4, with the optical slice thickness optimized for the different full force for a muscle fiber. This is again data from William Roman from Edgar Romich um, lab. 
So, what are the disadvantages? They are very related with the advantages. The increased resolution means that, um, uh, you know, uh, to be able to acquire these images, you don't acquire the image with a camera in a single snap of the sample. You need to scan your excitation spot on the sample point by point to build up um, an image. Um, you, you, it can be very slow because again, you're scanning point by point. So you can typically take one second to acquire um, an image. And PMTs, they amplify electrons a lot, the ones that the photocatalyst detects and generates electrons, but they only detect about 25% of incoming photons. There are new detectors now, gas detectors, hydrogen detectors, they are much more efficient, but compared you know, with cameras and with uh, EMCCDs, um, uh, traditionally confocals were not the most sensitive um, detector. It's, it's changed in the last years, but this was a, you know, in the in the eighties, in the nineties, this was this was this was a problem, and so the 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 solution for this to get a faster system and still have be able to have optical sectioning was to use multiple pinholes and a camera, and this is another version of the confocal microscope, which is called the spinning disk uh, confocal. You can see it here. So the idea is to expand the laser light, not focusing it on a single point, but expand it so that it um, it hits a disk, a Nipkov disk, which has multiple openings. Each of these will act as a pinhole. So actually, this is the disk where the pinholes are located. This is uh, another disk, uh, an invention by Yokogawa, that has micro lenses that will focus the laser uh, on the pinholes. So if you just have the pinholes here, most of the laser light will be you know, blocked by the disk. By having these micro lenses that capture more light that will be focused on the second disk of pinholes, you can increase the transmission through the spinning disk. The early spinning disk designs were um, um, really, were really, really required a lot of light from the sample because not a lot of light would go through the, the spinning disk. So the idea is that instead of illuminating the sample point by point, one at a time, you illuminate with thousands of points at the same time. Um, so you get uh, you, you get back uh, images of, of, of points that you can project in a camera. It's called spinning disk because this disk will be rotating. And as it rotates, um, the pinholes, the openings in the Nipkov disk are arranged in Archimedean spirals that every, um, every, every turn of the spinning disk is able to scan all the points in the image like this, each time that it scans, First, these are scans, then these, and also, and in a, in one rotation, the whole field of view gets scanned one point six times. Yes. Yeah. Uh, for example, can the light from one pinhole be diffused onto the neighbor? Yes, that's a very good question, and uh, we'll see um, that it can that it can that it can happen, particularly for fixed samples. But I'll uh, wait a few slides, and I'll show you uh, how that happens. And, and that's actually a limitation compared to the point scanning of focal. And so by by having this, this rotating, uh, illuminating the sample in many, many different uh, points um, at a time, and collecting the light that comes from these pinholes, we can project it in the camera, and we have a way of generating an image, a confocal, a confocal image. The spinning disk was invented um, and patented by Petan and Adravsky, and in the then uh, Czechoslovakia, now Czech uh, Republic, they submitted the patent in 67 um, uh, for use of a, of a Nipkov disk to achieve optical resolution. So this was this was not uh, this was not known for all the, in the time they were you know there was the iron curtain um, people didn't have um, access to what was happening there. Uh, Yokogawa is sometimes credited with inventing the spinning disk, but what they patented was the micro lens array. The um, spinning disk is the invention of Petran and Andrasky. Petran sadly passed away last year, 99 um, years old. His life story is amazing. He was a, a fighter also against Nazi occupation in the, the in then and Czechoslovakia. You can see this, you can see their original design here for the spinning disk. This red um this is where the spinning disk is. Um, and so they came up with the design that we still use uh, today. I mean, the addition of the micro lenses by Yokogawa later improved the amount of light that we can uh, transmit to the sample and, and get back. Um, but these are the colors of the spinning disk. 
And let me show you how it works. So this is a, a spinning disk uh, image from a sample from a spinning disk in the at the IBM. And what I did was that I stopped the spinning disk so you can see uh, where the pin holes are and how the image is acquired. Um, so we, we have a scanning of the sample and as the disk slows down, now you see where the pin holes are. Don't do this if you are the spinning disk. <laughs> <laughs> um, I will start it again. And what you will see is that as the disk rotates, so we are what we are getting here is like it's a little bit saturated because I wanted to show you where the pinholes are, but uh, we would be getting just uh, intensity from a single point in the sample um, with optical sectioning. We are not getting the light above and and below. As the disk will rotate, we'll get a point here, then here, then here. It rotates very very fast, five thousand rotations per minute, and so we will not be able to see this uh, this this movement. Uh, and you'll be able to acquire with exposure times in the camera of a few milliseconds, 10 milliseconds, 20 milliseconds, 50 milliseconds. Um, and because the disk is rotating so fast, you will not see this scanning, um, this scanning motion. I'm going to start it again. There we go. You see, it goes very, very fast. And now you have a confocal image. There you go. You have an optical uh, section of, of your images and that's acquired in milliseconds rather than, than seconds. So um, this is for very fast confocal image, this is ideal. There's another advantage, which is um, if you image things with a spinning disk, if you image a fluorescent sample, you photo bleach a lot less than with a point scanner. Um, this is probably due with the photophysics of the pool force, because on the point scanner, you are exciting each single point with a lot of laser light, capturing light from that point, point by point by point. On a spinning disk, each point is being intermittently excited. As the disk rotates, on, off, on, off, on, off, on, off. And so um, this. Uh, means that there will be less chances of the uh, floor to be in an excited uh, state and less chances of being photo bleached. So spinning this confocal microscope is very, very fast. Photo bleach is less. It's ideal for light imaging um, uh, with optical, with optical sectioning. So it uses multiple pinholes um, and you don't need a PMT, you don't use a point detector, you can actually use a camera a CCD or even an electron multiplying CCD, which are more expensive, but are able to detect single single photos. So a very, very sensitive uh, camera. This is, let me show you an example. This is the difference between uh, white field and spinning disk. This is exactly the same uh, sample from the plans at the also lab at IMM. Um, exactly the same sample on the white field microscope and on the spinning disk microscope. You can see that uh, we get rid of the blur above and below. And so you get the uh, uh, get to see only the um, focal plane of, of the sample. If we do a Z-stack on the white field and on the spinning disk, notice that even when we are far away from the sample, you see this blur on the white field. So as you travel, as you do this, like as you move the objective, you always see light coming from the sample. Yeah. Can I see the camera too? Yes, you can. With the speeding scroll, you will. It's just that the temporal resolution of the time lapse will be different. Okay. If on a confocal, uh, depending on the resolution, the number of points, the scanning time, it probably the fastest speed might go might be a second or 500 milliseconds. And on a spinning disk, you can go maybe 10 milliseconds or 20 milliseconds. Let me show you again. I want you to appreciate um, that you only actually have an image of your sample in the spinning disk when you go through the sample, when you actually reach the, the plane where the sample is. If you are above or below, you just don't see anything. You're not collecting any light because you are above uh, or, or below the sample. I want to show you this in 3D. So this is the uh, Z-stack reconstruction, we, we're going to, this is a maximum intensity projection um, 
of both of the white field and the and the spinning disk. If we rotate this 90 degrees to show the exit projection, you'll be able to see that um, on the white field, you basically you, you, you can actually see the point spread function, right? You, you get the light all over the sample, whereas on the, on the spinning disk, on the confocal, you only really get light from the point where the sample is. This is um, optical safety. This is an amazing device thing about time lapses. Of course, this is ideal for live imaging. I want to show you here two fantastic examples from uh, Mariana Denis, the, the expert in intravital imaging. What you see here on a spinning disk are trypanosome parasites moving um, uh, in the extracellular space between uh, cells. You couldn't do this on a point, you couldn't do this on a white field microscope because you couldn't see that. It would be just a big blur. Um, on the point scanning confocal, it would be too slow. So you wouldn't be able to watch them move like this. Or, and that one is even more impressive, you'll be able to see them just flowing in the um, in the blood, depending on some parasites. This is very, very hot. This is just uh, for 20 milliseconds. Uh, um, and it has two uh, fluorescent light. You can see that it's intravital, it's in the mouse. It's, it's 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 breathing. You can actually see some of the movement. Technically, this is very very it's very impressive um, from the uh, intervital um, setup. Like I told you, Mariana is an expert. From the from the uh, system point of view, the spinning disk is uh, uh, compared to the point scanner is the one that can achieve this uh, temporal resolution to be able to image this uh, this fast. But as you were pointing out um, uh, before. Um, you know, uh, what happens, we have multiple pinholes, um, even if uh, light that's emitted by the sample can go through one pinhole, but also from the ones that are just next to it. And this depends actually on the thickness of the sample. So if you have a very thin sample and you are illuminating just that uh, plane, um, light coming from the sample will hit uh, one of the pinholes and you get optical section and it's fine. But as you move the sample further away from the uh, from the spinning disk. It's, if it's very very thick, there's a point where light coming from um, uh, uh, the sample will diffuse in such a way that it will hit not only just one pinhole but adjacent pinholes. This is pinhole crosstalk or pinhole bleed, uh, bleed, bleed through. And so, if you have a very very thick um, sample. Whereas in the point scanning to focal scanning point by point, you only have one pinhole. Um, um, as you move out of, away from the sample, you get less and less and less light, so you don't see it. On the spinning disk, um, if you have a, a, a really thick sample, um, there's a point where you are not, you will not be able to remove the autofocus light. So you have this background of, of autofocus light. In your image that you will not have if you use a point scanning um, point scanning for photo. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the disadvantages. Yes. And you don't lose information with this if you are sample? You might lose information. Uh, yes, I mean if you uh, the point scanning for focal will give you a thinner um, slide and a higher signal to noise ratio at the expense of speed. So yes, for a very, very thick sample, a point scanning for focal will give you a higher resolution, more information than a spinning disk. Yes. Uh, I, I hope I'm getting this right. So imagine uh, working with bacteria mm -hmm. in the form of biofilms. Well, at some maturation stages, they move a lot. So I would hope that in spinning this confocal, uh, that movement of the bacteria would not be uh, so much detected as it is in the point scanning. So this problem you're talking is more attributed to fixed samples. No, the, this is depending on the thickness of, of the sample. For bacteria, if they are moving with a spinning disk, you'll be able to acquire at much higher rates, much faster. So you'll be able to see the bacteria moving. This will not create an artifact in your image. If you use a point scanning for focal and the scanning velocity is slow, you might get distortions. Um, you know, the bacteria is moving while you are imaging, so you might get this. Um, artifacts in the in the image. You might get like two bacteria, but it, it was only one that was something like that. Yes, yes, exactly. 
Um, you might not have enough temporal resolution to be able to image the bacteria as it moves. If the bacteria moves faster than the time you spend scanning on the point scanning for focal, then you have artifacts like that. The spinning disk will image them faster or can image them faster, so you will reduce this or eliminate this. This problem of the in-hole um, bleed through is related with fixed samples, not bacteria. You'll never see this in bacteria. But if you're looking at brain slices, if you're looking, or even um, or even in the intravital imaging of, of Mariana, you know, um, you can see some blur in here. You can see if we were to image this in the point scanning focal, the image would be much sharper. It would have less background. You'd see much thinner optical side. But it would just not be fast enough to image the internal some parasite. Okay, okay so um, the autofocus rejection of light on the spinning disk is not optimal for very, very thick samples. But for bacteria, for cells, for thin samples, it's absolutely um, uh, fantastic. And it's, um, Sorry, Andrew. Yeah. This might come up as the stupidest question, but the pen uh, wanted to see the mechanical limitation. Could you increase the rotation speed and increase the pinhole distance to reduce bleed through? Yeah. Well, these are physically drilled in the disk. You cannot change their size. That's another disadvantage. I told you that in the point scanning, you can change the size of the pinhole to match the optical slice thickness for different full force with different wavelengths. You cannot do that on a spinning disk. You have fixed spin all sides. What you can have is different spinning disks, different, different disks. And some systems will have two disks. Three, I'm not sure, but two disks. So you can choose between a disk with uh, uh, more spaced uh, pinholes so that you reduce, uh, so that you reduce this uh, um, effect of, of um, autofocus rejection for thicker samples, but if you're spreading the pinhole, then you're losing resolution. Okay, so it's always a balance. If you have a very, and you see some of the manufacturers of spinning disks, uh, we can we ha we can look at larger samples without autofocus uh, without autofocus light can, coming in. Sure, but it has less resolution than a disk where the pinholes are closer together. So you have a choice between probably two disks, but you cannot change the size of the pinholes. So again, you don't have the flexibility of a point scanning where you can actually change the size of the pinhole according to the resolution and to the flow force that you are that we that you are using. These are being mostly optimized in spinning disks for high numerical aperture objectives, typically for a 40x or 63x, um, and for samples that you know are maybe 50, 100 micrometers, but not more than that. They have really been optimized for live cell imaging. Okay. All right. I have a question for you. This image, which it's not Photoshop. We acquired it like this on the microscope. We were looking at uh, Wittmann Freire um, um, and uh, uh, Marie Rich at, at the IBM. Uh, we were looking at cells um, that were dividing. We were looking at uh, um, cell cycle. These are cells labeled with DAPI, the same that the, the DNA, and EDU uh, um, that will bind to um, uh, nucleotides that have been recently um, uh, synthesizing. So, uh, we acquired this on the on the mark, and all the little shape like this, like this question marks to from the distance. Was this acquired on a white field point scanner of spinning disk? That's a good question. Very good. <laughs> good, good. So these are cells. Yeah. These are just cells in a in a petri dish. They are not shaped. Could be any of them actually, right? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, well, it was a white field. Okay, if your sample is really, really thin, if we have just a monolayer of cells, you can notice from the size of the nuclei, we were using um, a 20x, not you know, uh, the field of view is quite big, we capture a bunch of, of, of cells. Um, if we are if we were using a 63x with NA 1.4, the nuclei would be four times, uh, three times, three times bigger. You probably see that you have out of focus. You probably tell that whether it was a white field or um, a confocal. 
But this, we are using a lower NA lens, 0 0.8, 20x. And the big field of view, they are quite small. The depth of field is quite big, so we can actually see the whole nuclei. We can distinguish the, the patterns. You don't need a profocal microscope if you want to see how the how your cell nuclear your cells look like, and they are in the single focal plane. You don't need to do optical sectioning um, when you can use a low magnitude, a low NA objective to capture all of the light coming from that plane. This was done on a light field microscope. Much less used than a profocal, much cheaper than a profocal, much faster than a profocal in atomic images. So, you know, I want to use a profocal because it's the best microscope that you have in the facility, not necessarily. Yeah. Um, there are actually other ways of doing optical um, sectioning besides confocal. So, we have the point scanning confocal, we have the spin use confocal, but we can also do optical sectioning and we can also do Z stacks. If we use um, multifocal microscopes, light sheet microscopes, or circular illumination microscopes. And I know this is an introduction to confocal microscopy, but I just wanted to mention uh, two more ways of doing optical section, which is multifocal and, and light sheet um, um, microscopy. Is that okay? <laughs> Feel the sense, yes, okay. All right, so um, also to tell you, um, uh, what are the advantages and disadvantages, you know, depending on your sample, you may have access to different technologies, which one of them um, works best. So um, let's start with two photon. Two photon is a weird thing. Um, it's, a, it's um, you, know, you, you know, in traditional fluorescence, you have a photon with a given wavelength that's absorbed by um, a molecule in the ground state, an electron in the ground state, it will be get excited. Spend some time in the excited state, a few nanoseconds, lose some energy as it vibrates and rotates, and then it comes back to one of the ground state energy levels, releasing another photon. You've heard about this in uh, in white in fluorescence uh, microscopy. In two photon microscopy, what happens is that instead of using excitation from a single photon, let's say with uh, 48 uh, nanometers. We are going to use two photons, each of them having half the energy of the single photon that would excite the electron. So twice the wavelength, okay? Instead of using 488 nanometer light, we're going to use 870 nanometers, infrared light, with high, um, lower energy, higher um, uh, wavelength. And what happens, and this is the weird part of it, if these photons with half the energy, if they coincide in time and space, if, if they happen to hit the molecule in such a tiny amount of time that they, uh, you know, this is quantum mechanics, they can be perceived as, as one, they can be absorbed um, with half, each one of them without the energy as if they were a single photon with the uh, full energy required for the transition. And so the rest is the same. Um, the, the electron will lose energy and will come back to the ground state emitting light um, as in normal fluorescence. But the excitation was done with two photons instead of what two um, um, uh, the energy of both of them summed up into um, into the excitation. And why is this um, um, why is this useful? Um, you can see here that you know in order to have this, this is really unlikely to happen. This is really rare. Okay, you need you need really to for two photons with added energy to coincide with such a small space, interval space and time, that it's very unlikely to occur. And so for to have multi photon microscope with laser light, we're going to pack a lot of photons in a, in a group. So it's going to be a pulse laser that sends a, a bunch of, of, of photons. The objective will, uh, as in a focal microscope, it will um, focus them on a single point and only in this point, we have a higher number of photons, a density high enough that we have this rare phenomenon of multi-photon excitation happening, okay? You don't have excitation happening above or below because you don't have a high enough number of photons. They are further apart, they're still being focused. It, 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 they're just, um, it's, it's just not possible to happen. It's very, very, very unlikely. So unlike on focal excitation that illuminates in a point, Focus light on the point, but still illuminates above and below. That's why you need the pinhole to re to reject all of this light that's emitted above and below the sample. On the multi-photon microscope, you can really just 
um, capture all the light that comes from the sample because you know that it only comes from the point where the objective is focusing the light. Rare multi-photon excitation in just that point. You don't need pin holes. You have um so this is this is a comparison between the three methods that we've seen so far. So in white field, you excite all of the sample, you capture light that comes from all over the sample. If it's not a thin sample, you get a big blur um, in your image. In the confocal, we focus light in a single point. And we use a confocal to, to reduce or to partially eliminate that light that comes above from above and below that point. In the two photon or multi photon microscopes, sometimes it's three, even rarer, but you only get the excitation in this femtometer, very, very small volume where you have enough density of photons uh, coinciding. Um, and so you don't need any pinhole, you just detect all of the light that comes from the sample because you know it comes from that point. The big advantage of this is because it's infrared light, we are able to penetrate deeper, much deeper in the sample. Whereas um, in a confocal microscope, we can image up to 100, 150 if we're lucky, and then um, you know light gets scattered, absorbed, uh, particularly uh, in the blue and green uh, wavelengths. Um, we cannot image further deeper in the in the samples unless they're cleared. Um, uh, with confocal microscopy because of the light absorption and scattering. But with two photon, because we're using infrared light, which really there's a transparency window in biological material for uh, red and infrared light. That's why when you place a light or a lamp in your hand, you see it red. It's not because you're seeing blood, it's because it's the red light that's coming through. It's not being absorbed or scattered by biological tissue. So you can image deeper and deeper. This is this is what you image with the confocal microscope around 150 with a two photon, you can go almost to one millimeter with infrared light. So you can image very, very deep in the brain of mice looking at neurons, um, for instance. So why don't we use multi photons for everything? Because they're highly expensive for one. The pulse laser is really, really expensive. And because, you know, it, it's infrared light, it's twice the wavelength. The resolution is uh, the point spread function is less than big. Okay, you have um, this. These are the point spread functions of, of wide field microscope, a confocal microscope. Notice that there is a slight increase in x and y, 1.4 to be precise, but mostly it's in z that you gain. You don't have these lobes of the point spread function being detected. On the multi photon, you do have a optical section, but the uh, Point spread function is almost twice the size. You don't get the same resolution as, a, as in a confocal. So it's only useful if you want the image. Really, really big. Okay. Um, the other one I wanted to talk to you about is um, light sheet microscope. I'm not sure if you've heard already about light sheet microscope um, in the course um, before. Um, it's also an optical searching method. And you know, of the all of the methods that we've been talking about um, so far, they are epifluorescent methods, meaning that the epi means the same. So it's the same objective that's being used to illuminate the sample with excitation light and to collect the light emitted from the sample and to detect it. So we use the same objective to illuminate and to detect. On the light sheet microscope, we separate both. So we'll have an objective for illumination and an objective for detection. And we will achieve optical sectioning cleverly by illuminating perpendicular from to the objective detection. So we will illuminate the sample from the side at a 90 degrees angle using not just a beam of light, but a sheet of light. So we can use several tricks. We can use cylindrical lenses to shape the, uh, the illumination light the plane or we can scan very fast a laser beam along uh, this uh, direction to create a sheet of light that will illuminate the samples that we want to And then we have an objective just doing white field microscopy, capturing all the light that comes from the sample with the camera, because we are only illuminating that uh, plane in the sample. So we decouple illumination and detection. We um, get optical sectioning because we are just illuminating that plane. And it's white field detection, so it's very, very fast. 
Also, there's the advantage that uh, we don't photo bleach as much. All of the other methods, um, except multifoton, because it only uh, uh, excites in the point, but um, confocal point standing spinning disc, you will illuminate the sample from top to bottom. Um, and, and you just detect light from the plane, but all the sample is illuminated. Think about this, when you're doing a Z-stack and you're applying a hundred slices, you're just detecting the light from each slice. But when you get to slice number 15, 50, it was already illuminated 50 times before as you were acquiring the previous plane. And so you get photo damage along, um, along the, uh, the sample. On the light sheet, you're just illuminating the plane that you are detecting, and so photo damage is limited to that plane. The other ones are not being excited, so they are not being um, photo bleached. This is an example of light sheet um, imaging at the IBM from a cleared sample. Light sheet is used for very, very, very big um, samples. This is the retina of an iPhone calling Branco's um, lab a few years ago. Um, and you can see it as we rotate it. This is the retina. You can see the vasculature of, of the eye. This is very, very thick. This is, this is almost like a millimeter. If you were to image this on a confocal, you would need to squash it and you would you break it. You if you look at confocal images, they look like flowers with four petals because they have the the 3D architecture of the retina has to be destroyed to be able to uh, have it in a 150 to 100 micron um, uh, section. Yes. You can do it from one side or from two sides. Um, in this case, it's two sides. Uh, we have a light sheet at the IMM that uses two sides. You have also some light sheet that only illuminate from one side. But from one side, can't or doesn't the sample illuminate differently? Yes, of course, it will, and and it will also create some 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 shadows which you will see. So traditionally, historically, the sample can be rotated so that you illuminate it evenly, or you can use illumination from both sides, so matching two planes of light in the sample. You can adjust the parameters so that they are uniform in that you don't have this, this, uh, this, this difference. And you still have absorption and scattering. So light sheet was historically used for zebra fish because they are transparent. And once optical clearing appeared, then you're able to remove the liquids and all the motors in the samples that absorb and diffract light. Uh, we just looked at the fluorescent labels. Then there was a boom in light sheet usage. And this is um, this is exactly an example of it. So this is this is a clear retina sample where all the liquids, all the components that were absorbing and refracting light were removed. So we are just looking at one millimeter of tissue, fully transparent, and we are seeing the um, fluorescent staining of the blood vessels in red and um, cells, you can see here single cells um, with green staining that will be, um, uh, that, will pay, that will play a crucial role in this case in defining where the um, blood vessels will be, uh, will, will be formed. And so um, the light sheet, depending on the thickness of the light sheet that's generated, you may not have the same resolution as in a point scanning for focal, but you are able to image much, much larger um, volumes and very, very fast. It's the z step machine. So we can acquire a z step in one millimeter, 200, 300 slices in a few seconds. So this generates terabytes of, of data. So which one of them do you use? This is just a, um, some, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 highlighting some some help for choosing the right microscope depending on your on your sample um if you have a fixed sample um if it's not live you don't need a lot of temporal resolution you can do the image fast you probably stain them with very bright dyes um that have also anti-fading reagents with the medium so they will not photo bleach as fast these can be sample these can be much for longer you will most likely use a, a, a point scanning confocal either for thin or fixed samples. For thin samples, if you want to use a high end objective, if you if you want to resolve subcellular structures, you'll see that it's blurred on the light field if you use a higher NA. So you go for a point scanning confocal. If it's a low NA, low magnification, the cells in, in, the, in the question uh, mark side, you can go for a wide field. But if it's a high NA confocal, um, if the sample is thick, 
confocal, but not too thick. If it's thicker than 150 micrometers, then you might not, uh, and it's not clear, then you might uh, need to go to a multifocal. Or if it's really, really big and you have a, and, and you need a system with a long working distance, you might go for a, for a light sheet. Really thick, things higher than half a millimeter, you go for a light sheet. So point scanning confocal will be the choice for thin and thick samples uh, up to 100, 150 micrometers. No spinning is because you know, yeah, you can image fast, but you have less resolution. For live samples, we need to image. Well, now we have, um, we have an issue. We, we might have photo damage, we might have photo bleaching, we want to image fast. Things life is very dynamic, as we'll see in the next lecture. Um, things will move very, very fast. And live cells don't really like to be imaged with light. They will not, the, 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 the higher the amount of light that you use, uh, you'll stress them, they'll die, they don't really like it. So here, um, uh, unsurprisingly, spinning disk wins. So if you know if it's a very thin sample, a low and you can either you you can either use a wide field or a spinning disk. It doesn't really make a difference except for the availability of 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 the system and, and the cost of the of, of, of using it. But you um, with a low and you get a very similar image. Probably your white field will be better because you might have a CMOS camera with a higher resolution. On the spinning disk, you have probably an EMC CD with um, 512 by 512 pixels. So uh, you'll probably have less resolution, flat resolution than, than the white field. With a higher NA and you need optical sectioning, spinning disk. Your live imaging of single cells uh, with uh, um, um, Glass removing or microtubules, the cell dividing, all of these that you see are made on spinning uh, on spinning disk. Um, if the sample starts to get thicker, um, and uh, you know you can use a point scanning or focal, but if you want to do it fast with high sensitivity, no photo damage, spinning disk. If it gets really thick and you start to see out of focus light because of the problem that we saw of the pinhole crosstalk then you go for a point scanning um, confocal. And again, for thicker samples, multifocal or light sheet. Now bear in mind that this is relative to the traditional point scanning microscope. There was a lot of development in the last, in the last years uh, with more sensitive detectors, with faster scanning speeds, with resonant, uh, um, resonant scanning and more sensitive dust detectors. So um, I showed with the LSN 980 from Zeiss, the air scan, uh, particularly in the multiplex mode where it scans eight lines at a time, it's, it's coming close to what spinning these components um, can do. So the, this, this, uh, this, it's already a little bit um, outdated, but you get to see the principle. Um, we have a lot more variety of systems, um, uh, which makes the choice of the system really depending on a lot of factors, but these uh, could be some general guidelines that you can use on what would be the, the best the best system. All right, that's it. I want just to mention and thank the people from IMM that provided me with the, the images that I showed you, some of the illustrations that were not referenced come from these um, um, sites that I highly recommend you to uh, check it out. They have um, besides beautiful animations and drawings, they have they describe all of these things in the um, in details, and I don't know if you have um, more questions. Thank you. Any questions? You 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 said that um, in the spinning disk you can have the microscopic tool. Yes, um, I mean, it can. Um, so some spinning disks will actually have basically two disks that you can interchange. They will be automatic, you will be able to just changing the software, the option to change it from one to the other. Mm -hmm. If you have a spinning disk, you can, of course, buy another spinning disk okay. and just replace the module. Okay. Um, it takes some alignment, it takes some, uh, but the, the spinning disk itself, it's really just a box that you place between 
the camera detector and the computer. So it's not something that you swap, like you swap an objective. Okay. But if you want to have a new spinning disc, you don't need to buy the whole system. You can just buy the spinning disc pad and replace it in a, uh, in a system that you already have, keeping the microscope and the camera closer. Just upgrade the... You can upgrade, yes, yes. Okay. Um, yeah. Any other question? I have one. Um, mostly because uh, I didn't know we were going to talk about quantum physics in the morning, so I might okay. have Sorry. <laughs> uh, probably it doesn't make any sense, but the, would there be a flow of force that are more amenable to not single dual field? Two photon absorption. Um, no, no, perfectly clear. Not really. You can use the same full force. The the wavelength that you use to excite them is not some. It's not the sum necessarily. The sum yes. of of the wavelengths of the peak excitation of the excite of the, of the single photon excitation spectrum it doesn't really work like that. The, the excitation spectrum of multiphotons is somewhat complex. So if you have a full four that has a peak at 500 nanometers excitation, it doesn't mean that you are going to use uh, um, 1,000 uh, nanometers uh, uh, excitation in multiphotons. It could be 900, 920 or 850. It's not really, it's not really linear. Um, but um, there haven't been, as far as I know, Specific developments on full four that would be better or that will optimize for multi photon microscopy. You can, the multi photon laser, you can tune it. So, most of the time, ours, you can tune from 680 nanometers to 1020. So, it's just finding what's the best wavelength, what's the peak wavelength to excite them. Um, but you use you use the same full four that, that you use for, for traditional uh, microscopy. Um, not all of them will, will work. Not all of them will give you the same, the same results. So um, if you want to do, I mean, GFP is fine and Cherry is fine. If you want to do confocal microscopy and they have um, uh, multiphoto microscopy and have a particular dye, it's highly recommendable to see if it's published already some news, uh, some news of, of, of it. But, um, but, but that's the principle. It's just finding what's the, what is the uh, infrared excitation that will excite it the, um, the most. Yeah, and it's not necessarily just the sum of the excitation of the wavelength. For the ready for the second part. So um, we've seen how a point scanning focal microscope um, works. I'm going to show you now how we can use it to look at uh, more than just acquiring an image and an image with optical sectioning, more than just doing 3D microscopy. How uh, we can actually use it as a very powerful tool to look at molecular dynamics and interactions in the, um, in my cell. So I've called this the F techniques. I'm going to show you uh, a bunch of them. Some of them I'm going to talk about uh, FRAP, FCS, FRAP, LEAN. These are all um, um, advanced persons microscopy methods that we can use to probe how things work inside um, inside living cells. And, and I've used a um, um, few of them quite, quite a lot as well. So I'm actually going to show you this, showing some results of my own, um, from my own PhD work in Carlos Fonseca lab at, at, at the IMM, um, where uh, we were studying mRNA biogenesis, uh, looking how from the DNA mRNA is transcribed, processed um, uh, in the nucleus before being exported and being translated to proteins um, in, the, in, the, in the cytoplasm. And Carmo Fonseca labs at the time, Carmo Fonseca's lab at the time was 
interested in a specific part of mRNA processing, um, there are three things that happen to the mRNA as it is being transcribed. There's the, the, the capping, the addition of a five prime cap. There's splicing, the removal of sequences that will not be, um, that will not code for protein, that will not be present in the final transcript that will be translated. And then all the adenylation. So we are studying splicing at the time. Um, a very important mechanism. If it's not done correctly, it will lead to disease. Um, it's also a major source of uh, protein diversity. You know, we have more or less the same genes as a fruit fly, but more, many more of, of proteins. And this is because by splicing different sequences in different orders, we can generate different proteins from the same um, from the same original template. I'm sure you know about this. Um, splicing is performed by a huge macromolecular complex called the, the spliceosome. It's very, very big. It, it's formed by five different special small nuclear RNAs that you can see here, and hundreds of proteins. Uh, it actually has a very dynamic composition. The protein component will change as the splicing reaction occurs. If you look at it through an electron microscope, and after this we'll see how an electron microscope works, but it's quite big. You can see here, so this is a naked RNA uh, uh, in vitro outside of a, of a cell. And this huge blob is the, the machine that does the, the splicing, the removal of the inference uh, called the splice so We were very interested at the time in finding out how splicing happens inside living cells and how um, uh, and how it is regulated. And um, you know, this was um, some time ago. We if we label some of the protein components of the spliceosome with fluorescent proteins, this is what we see. Um, I'm showing the cytoplasm in, in green. It's not a splicing factor, just for you to see how the cell looks like. But in, with the red fluorescent saying, you see a splicing factor, one of them, one of the hundreds of splicing factors. And what you see is that the distribution in the nucleus is not homogeneous. Um, there are areas where it's brighter, where it accumulates. There are areas here on this well line where they are not present. So the, the distribution is not really um, homogeneous. Um, and we were interested in being able to observe in living cells how splicing occurs. We didn't have the tools back then to look at single molecules, splicing, single molecule being, being uh, transcribed. We did this some years later. But at the time, we had a cofocal um, microscope. We could image fluorescently labeled uh, proteins, fluorescently labeled um, splicing factors in the cofocal. And that's how I started my PhD. Um, I, I'm a physics, a physicist by, by training. And um, Carmo had um, uh, recruited me to her lab to use a cofocal microscope to look at the dynamics of, of these uh, splicing factors. And so what we were trying to do were to look at the kinetics of splicing. How does it happen? How long does it take? How does it assemble on this nucleic side? And back in that time, it was thought that you know, most of the splicing assays were done in vitro in the test tube so that the splicing machinery would be recruited step by step. First comes the U1, then the U2. They are conveniently named by the order in which they are detected in vitro. Um, and the, the splicing reaction would take 30 minutes. We, we, people could uh, uh, replicate the splicing reaction outside of the cell. It would take half an hour, 40 minutes. Um, uh, and we are wanting to, we, we are wondering how does it happen in a live um, in a live cell. And so what we wanted to ask was we wanted to be able to measure the dynamics of the splicing factors. Um, uh, we wanted to be able to um, quantify how fast are they moving. Um, and so um, to do this, we used um, a recent technique called um, called FRAP. So we had we have live samples. Um, of course, uh, uh, when you do live imaging, you have it's not as easy as doing an image of a big sample. Of course, you have you have to build an incubator around around your uh, microscope. You have to check that you're not as, uh, affecting your sample health, that you have the right temporary spatial resolution and sensitivity to get signal from the sample cells. Um, cells don't really look like sometimes well, how you see them in a in a microscope um, uh, slides to be in order to see them. Um, live and functional, you have to place them in, in petri dishes where the bottom was replaced by a cover stick. You can also do this with well plates and, and uh, custom um, slides with different shape designs uh, nowadays. We use the um, a petri dish um, uh, uh, with, with cells we, uh, to avoid 
uh, autofluorescence in the medium, uh, it's very useful to replace the medium with medium that does not have chemo red, so we could capture specific fluorescence from your from our uh, fluorescent dyes and not the media itself. And we basically place place the cells in a, a focal microscope that has an incubator uh, around it. There's much more to um, live imaging needs, but I'll just leave it at that just to produce that we, you do need special um, equipment to do live imaging. And cells, like I told you before, don't really like being imaged. They don't like light. They are stressed under light. If you if you use too much light, they will um, uh, you will see different um, photo damage um, uh, phenomenon or phototoxicity. They may start to bleed. You can see them already dead. They will have multiple nuclei as you uh, in multiple generations of the cell because of the DNA damage caused by intense uh, illumination. You can see that they are stressed when you can see a lot of vacuoles, swollen mitochondria, and you start to see first of protein aggregates. These are all signs that you're not doing it right, that you're using maybe just too much light. That's it, too much light, and you'll start to see things that are not um, physiological. And one of the things that, um, even without photo damage, one of the things that could also affect imaging is photo bleaching itself. Maybe the cell is fine, it can handle the lights that you're using it, that you're using to image it, but your full form might not. So if you use your laser, the AOTF that we have seen at 100%, what you see is an irreversible loss of photo bleaching with time. You'll just, typically you say we burn the, the, the full form, we lose the fluorescence. And this happens because as you excite your full form over and over and over, you go through the fluorescence cycle many, many, many times. When the electron is in the excited state, um, particularly if you have oxygen uh, in your cells, which you do when it's live cells, not when it's fixed cells where oxygen was removed, but when this oxygen might snatch the electron in the excited state um, and become, and, and your full form will lose the electron that, it, that undergoes the fluorescent cycle. So you don't have fluorescence anymore. Even worse than that, the oxygen with an extra electron is a reactive oxygen species. It will be toxic for the cell. So if you use too much light, if you're lucky, you have photo bleaching just, but it also induce photo damage as, as I showed you uh, before. And if you have photo bleaching, uh, you won't be able to image them for long. So photo bleaching is something that we absolutely avoid and try to minimize when we do light imaging. And this means using the IOTF, lowering, lowering the transmission of the laser. 2%, 0.1 in the particle photos we're imaging with 0.1 transmission of a laser that even weaker than it was um, 10 or 15 years ago, and to avoid um, to avoid photo bleaching and also increasing the speed of, of acquisition. So photo bleaching is something that we always want to avoid unless we can use it to our advantage. And this is the idea behind the first technique, which is called FRAP. Fluorescence recovery after photo bleaching. Now, the idea here, it's very elegant, it's very simple. Prop is a 40 year old technique. It was first used to look at um, uh, lateral diffusion of uh, fluorescent dyes in, in, the, in solution in the brain of membranes of cells with the appearance of fluorescent proteins. It revolutionized the way that we think about the dynamics of cells and what happens uh, inside the live cell. The basic idea is to use photo bleaching in a controlled way. Okay, so we will have our, um, this is a slide from uh, Zerargan and many years ago. Uh, let's assume that this is a cell or a, 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 a nucleus where you full of fluorescently labeled uh, proteins that we are imaging with very, very low light intensity so that we can image. The laser very, very fast in microseconds. So we can actually say, you know, scan with 0.1% here, 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 but inside this region change to 100%. And we can image just this, we can photo bleach just this area with a very high intensity laser, specifically there. Why? If the sample is fixed, if the molecules are immobile, we just have a black region of interest where for instance was irreversibly lost. We sometimes do this in Christmas. We have a fixed sample, we draw off Christmas trees and, 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 and things. We can do that. But on the live cell, you know, 
And the main idea and the advantage of this is if you continue to image uh, the cell um, uh, over time, and we look at the fluorescence in the area where uh, we bleach with a high intensity laser, if we have molecular mobility, if the molecules are moving over time, the molecules that were bleached will move away from that spot and will be replaced by molecules that were not bleached. And so if we monitor the person's recovery after total bleaching over time, we get a FRAP curve that looks like this. And, you know, okay, if we don't have recovery, we, they are not mobile, they are fixed here. If we have recovery, they are mobile, which is, which is great. We can already tell things. But from the shape of the curve, we can extract a lot of um, parameters. Um, for instance, um, I mean, uh, even if we have uh, if we have an incomplete recovery, we can calculate that there is a fraction of protein that was not replaced. So maybe we have an immobile fraction at that site. 20% of the, for instance, we, uh, we have 80% recovery, which means that 20% of the molecules were not replaced. Maybe we have a fixed population bound to something very immobile on that, uh, on that side. Um, but we can go one step further, and from the shape of the curve, as I could tell you, we can use mathematical modeling um, and um, uh, other numerical approaches to extract uh, quantitative parameters of, of mobility. And these would be, for instance, diffusion coefficients. Not necessarily the speed at which each molecule um, moves, but um, the diffusion coefficient is a measure of what's the, what's the area in which proteins move in a given amount of time. For instance, GFP alone, um, just as GFP molecule that's not binding to anything in the nucleus, diffuses with a diffusion coefficient of 30 square microns per second. It means that in one second, it can travel in an area of 30 square microns. Well, three times the area of the nucleus. It can move really, really, really fast. So we can get these uh, quantitative parameters if we, um, if, if we use appropriate um, uh, from uh, uh, numerical modeling or fitting uh, approaches. But we can just see, and this is one of the very first uh, um, papers showing FRAP in live cells with GFP labeled um, proteins, in this case, lemon B receptor fusion proteins. Notice by this very elegant experiment by, by uh, Ellenberg um, in, in 1997 by Jan Ellenberg that looking at the lemon B, when uh, photobleaching is performed in the cytoplasm, we have full recovery. So lemon B is fully mobile in the cytoplasm. But when you bleach part of the nuclear um, uh, envelope here, you don't have a recovery. So the lemon B receptor it, it, it exhibits different mobility when, when it's just localizing the ER or when it's already part of the nuclear lemon, where it's uh, immobile. And you can see this just from a, a FRAP experiment. The early studies of FRAP showed that, with the exception of um, proteins that are part of the nuclear lamina or histones in the DNA, almost every protein is mobile in the nucleus. We have all moving around all the all the organelles that you saw that people were seeing with uh, with fluorescence in situ hybridization, with immunofluorescence, you know, uh, we have we have Golgi, we have uh, um, uh, we have microtubules, we have uh, we have the uh, endosomes, and all of these is dynamic, are dynamic. And in the very early stages of crop, people had a hard time accepting that everything was mobile in the cell. This could, this did not match what what they how they thought things were from in vitro experiments and things that were done outside of, of the cell. So the what we take now for granted that the cell is a very um, um, liquid, very dynamic environment with liquid, liquid phase separation, proteins moving, interacting. This is very recent, 30 years ago. This is really a, a, a fight to um, uh, to reconcile data coming from um, FRAP experiments and cococo microscopy with biochemical data coming from um, uh, in vitro experiments. So as you saw um, here in this example, it's actually quite simple to do a FRAP experiment on a microscope. You, you choose a, a cell with a GFP tagged uh, protein. You define a region of interest that you want to bleach. In this case, they define a rectangle, but you can draw um, a, cir a circle, you can draw different, different shapes. Most of the confocal softwares nowadays allow you to freely define regions of interest with arbitrary shapes. 
and you set up a time lapse. You're going to apply your images over time. You want to see the dynamics. And at one point, uh, maybe not the first point because you want reference images of what the fluorescence intensity looks like, but uh, after three uh, images or five, you're going to do the photo bleaching on purpose with a laser at 100% in a specific region. And then you monitor, you continue imaging without bleaching, and you monitor the fluorescence and um, the fluorescence interval. So what is happening is you're not destroying the protein that is tagged with GFP. You're not changing its function. You're just um, uh, turning off the fluorescence of a subset of particles. So it's like the inverse of a tracer experiment where you label some of them to see where they are going. Here you, uh, here you deplete the fluorescence of some of them. The, the, the proteins, the lamin that was photo bleached here, the lamin B receptor, still there, it's still functioning. It didn't go anywhere. It's just that the fluorescent protein that it has attached is not emitting light anymore. So you are perturbing, you are perturbing the steady state um, uh, uh, distribution of, of the fluorescent molecules. And by looking at the redistribution, you are able to, you are going to be able to see the dynamics of the process um, in question. Okay, let's see a FRAP experiment. So this is a, a cell, it's expressing um, a GFT, GFP tag molecule that's binding to specific RNAs in this transcription site. This is a random integration of uh, um, a gene, a better, modified beta globin gene that uh, in the lab were added to U2OS cells. And so here we have um, RNAs being transcribed that are bound by this GFP molecule. Let's see how long it takes for these RNAs to be um, uh, turned over, to be released, and new and one will be uh, um, transcribed. So we did a FRAP experiment there. There you go. And this is in real time. Um, I don't have a time slide, but you can see that it recovers um, uh, that it recovers very, very, uh, very, very fast. Um, we need to be able now to extract the. Um, we need to extract the fluorescence of this point, but because the cell is alive, what you saw is that it was moving away. So we can, most of the times, you don't really just go to the image and extract the curve. We have to do um, some um, image uh, analysis and processing. I know that uh, Estibaldi showed you yesterday some um, uh, uh, image uh, plugins like Tuberway, which we also used in this a sequence to correct for the cell uh, movement, subtract background, correct for the cell movement, and then we can extract, um, and then we can extract um, a FRAP curve. Okay, I'm just going to give a little bit more detail for those of you that actually want to do a FRAP. I highly encourage you to. It's, it's really easy. Um, and also the the data um, extraction. The one thing you need to do because you know as you can also see a little bit in this image. Even if you use a very low transmission of the laser, you still have a little bit of photo bleaching during the sequence set of imaging. Maybe it's just 10% if you image for um, a few seconds, but it's there. Here it's highly exaggerated, but if you do have a little bit of photo bleaching while you are imaging, instead of having a FRAP recovery curve that looks like this, it will start to recover and then it goes down because you'll have a total loss of fluorescence just due to, uh, to imaging. It's highly reduced, but it can happen. So to understand if you have a full recovery or not, and to normalize for this or to control for this, it's a very simple normalization. You just look at the total fluorescence of the cell or of a naval cell. That if it's in the time span of a few minutes and you have no um, production of new GFP level protein, it should remain the same. So we just normalize for that. We just see what is the total loss of fluorescence due to imaging, and we um, uh, correct for that to have the full recovery. Okay, uh, you'll have this presentation in Vienna. Just uh, you, uh, I wanted you to have this as a as a reference, so you don't forget to to do this. But if you are interested, I can give you more details uh, later. So what we did, let me show you some uh, some results. What we did was to look at the dynamics of splicing factors inside nuclei. We found very, very fast that they were really mobile. That looked, I mean, the first FRAP assays, we bleached, and immediately we saw in the next image a recovery. So they were moving really fast. So we had to use our confocal microscope in a clever way. Instead of acquiring the full frame, we were just acquiring a stripe like this. So instead of acquiring 500 and 
12 lines, we were just uh, imaging 50, 10 times faster. So we're just imaging very, very fast, a small um, area of the cell. This is an advantage of the confocal point scanning microscope. You can also define freely what's the area that you are imaging, so you can go faster. You can see by the noise that the scanning mirrors were moving very, very fast. And um, using this, we could uh, get fractures that look like this. And so we had recovery uh, in a few seconds of our splicing factor um, labeled with uh, GFP. They're moving really fast. Okay, so they were dynamic. How dynamic? By the way, you can also do the same thing on the white field or on the spinning disk. You cannot really define a region of interest. You require an image of the whole um, area. But you can place in the optical path um, masks with different apertures and that will allow a second laser line to uh, illuminate just a particular region in the cell. I'm showing you there an example on the top right corner where using a mask like this with a circular region, uh, we could be imaging on a spinning disk very fast while bleaching was performed in the region and then monitor the recovery. So it's possible. You typically have to buy an additional laser and additional optics components, and you can have frac modules for white fields or spinning disks. Right, coming back to us. So we have a frac curve and we have recovery. And maybe in some situations we have fast kinetics and in the other slow kinetics. And we want to uh, compare them and to extract um, some, some data. There are two routes for this. There's the hard way where we can go um, um, with uh, you know modeling parameters estimation and get um, and measure and determine um, uh, things like the diffusion coefficient or we can do it the easy way and we can just compare the curves and say look there's a there's a statistical difference between them. I'm not calculating any parameters any diffusion coefficient parameters but I can show reliably that uh, this curve is slower because the time to reach 90% recovery is much longer than not this one. And you can do statistics on this. So you don't have to go full blown physics modeling to get quantitative uh, parameters. You can just see look, it's a fast um, recovery, a slow recovery. This is associated with a biological process, and here is the difference. We went the hard way. And we, uh, um, and at the time, there was a lot of developments in um, expanding the initial FRAP experiments, which were made in a solution or in membranes in, for lateral diffusion in a circular uh, profile. This was done by Daniel Axelrod 40 years ago uh, to expand it to confocal microscopes and fluorescent proteins in living, in living samples. Um, the Lab of Carmo Fonseca came up with its own contribution to the field. This is the work of Jose Raga, where we were able at the time to measure much, much faster diffusion coefficients um, than using the traditional formulas by taking into account diffusion that also occurred during bleaching. Uh, we're not going to, I just want to show you a complicated formula to show you that we were doing this really um, on a quantitative um, level and we were able to extract diffusion coefficients, which is what I'm going to show you now. What kind of, um, what kind of conclusions can, can you draw from, from this? Um, and so, when we look at different splicing factors, we could see that they would diffuse, that they were um, that they were highly mobile. We could calculate diffusion coefficients, um, and, and some were moving uh, slower than others, which was expected. This is U two AF thirty thirty five is the molecular weight, so this molecule has thirty five kilodalton plus thirty kilodalton from GFP. That one is sixty five, so that one moves a little bit slower. The bigger molecule, so okay, it's expected. But when we compare with um, exogenous molecules, with molecules that were injected in the cell that had more or less the same size as our splicing factors, they were moving 10, 10 times faster. And if they were just diffusing uh, around, we would expect the diffusion coefficient to, you know, it depends on the hydrodynamic radius of the molecule. Einstein um, showed, came, um, uh, uh, came up with a formula for, um, for that. What we are seeing is that our splicing factors that were involved in splicing were moving 10 times slower than molecules that had more or less the same size. So something was slowing them down. We then started um, uh, changing the sequence of these splicing factors, introducing mutations, and we could see that by abolishing the domains that allow them to interact with each other to form the splices from 
um, by changing them, we would make them uh, we would make them diffuse faster. For instance, this um, this SF one splicing factor just a single point mutation that abolished its ability to interact with into layer sixty five. That's what they do in the splicing um, we now um, have a diffusion coefficient very similar to the one from the taxon, from the exogenous molecule. So if you don't allow them to bind to each other, they would move as freely as free molecules. So what we were uh, being able to measure with, uh, with FRAP technique was that the mobility of these parameters, how fast they move, was direct related with their ability to interact with each other. Maybe they were already assembling splicosomes and therefore moving slower. Um, and so this is the first thing that, okay, but uh, the interesting thing is that when we used drugs that uh, prevented uh, the transcription of new RNAs, they would still move slower. So this was giving us the idea that, you know, maybe they are interacting with each other and forming complexes or precomplexes, even without the mRNA, which was kind of contradicting with the idea that they will be recruited to nation to nation RNAs that they were being transcribed. So something new there. All right, just to show you that what I was saying before, uh, you could probably show the same difference, although with not, not with um, diffusion coefficient values, but you can um, you can use also a statistics approach just to show that you have different NF to different um, with different factors. There are nowadays software freely, freely available software that you can use to process FRAP data. So you can do a FRAP experiment on the Pococo, and you can use, um, for instance, I'm going to give you some examples, FRAP Calc from uh, Kotemuga, um, or Easy FRAP. There's now also a web version where you can upload your data in the Google the normalization and for fitting, so you can have uh, some parameters. A more recent one, FRAP Bot, which was written in R, um, that will also um, do automatic analysis, the privilege. So there are now a bunch of tools that you can use to quantify um, to quantify uh, the fraud. Um, any questions so far? So um, there are also other variants of fraud that were developed at, at the time. Once people started exploring the dynamics of molecules, um, IFRAP, for instance, is the inverse fraud. Instead of bleaching an area, you bleach everything else except that area. And then you look at the recovery. I'm showing you here another paper from William Nellenberg is uh, fantastic. <laughs> Very good. So this um, in this case, and this here you can see, for instance, that um, LC3 and um, when cells are under stress, they, they form these autophagosomes. But this IFREP experiment shows that um, these these uh, puncta, these autophagosomes are formed from LC3 that was in the nucleus, but not in the cytoplasm. Notice that the, if we photo bleach the nucleus, we don't have autophagosomes being formed, but just a few of them. They're still being formed, but the LC3 that's forming the autophagosome is not labeled with GFP because they were photo bleached. So the LC3 that was in the nucleus. Um, is the one that's forming the autophagosomes. If you do the reverse, if you if you photo bleach the cytoplasm, now you have phagosomes being formed, autophagosomes being formed, which means that they are being formed by LC3 that's coming from the nucleus, not from the one that's synthesizing the cytoplasm. And this matches a um, um, uh, 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 biological process that was discovered in this paper that LC3 needs to be deacetylated in the nucleus before it can form the autophagosomes. So this is a very ingenious, very elegant use of inverse FAP to show in live cells that clearly only LC3 that was in the nucleus can form the auto, the auto protocol. Very, very simple, very powerful, very intuitive. The same thing can be done with photoactivation. And you know that we have fluorescent proteins, but we also have um, um, photoactivatable proteins, like photoactivatable GFT, that is dark and will be illuminated with violet light, and then it becomes like a normal GFT. Or dendra that is green, you excite with violet, and it becomes red. So you can also use this optical highlights technique to do the inverse of that. Instead of bleaching, you can activate and then look at the dynamics over time. All good? Mm -hmm. Now I have another question for you. Hmm. We have FRAP with which we can bleach molecules, and we have activation with which we can activate molecules. 
So if we have binding, for instance, if we have a protein that's binding to RNA or to DNA, stays there for a while and then leaves, if, if we do FRAP, we photo bleach the ones that are already there and the recovery is from the molecules that are coming to the same spot. You're gonna see the recruitment of molecules. If we activate, we see the molecules that are there and we're gonna see first and slow go down as they leave. So by doing FRAP, we can see the dynamics of recruitment, of binding, and by doing photoactivation, we can see the dynamics of unbinding. Yeah? You think this sounds? No. <laughs> um, no, because um, both, what both techniques do, I mean, you are perturbing, you are perturbing, um, there's a steady state moment where they are binding and unbinding, they're always doing that. You're changing the um, emission or lack of emission of just a few of them, but what you are measuring is always the same dynamic process of binding and unbinding. Molecules cannot bind to a binding site if, if the molecule that's already there doesn't unbind for this. And so if you do a FRAP and a photoactivation, and you the normalization is quite similar. In fact, you can do either one or the other. Um, um, and you can check uh, um, you, 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 you can check this paper to uh, to know what are the, the processing steps, but they are really very similar. I'm highlighting here how they're, in, in fact, in some ways, they are the mirror of each other. And if you image the same molecules in the same binding process, what you get is exactly the same dynamics. It's just that one is will be recovering fluorescence and the other one will be losing the fluorescence. But the shape of the curve, you can mirror it because it's the same, what you're measuring is both binding and unbinding at the same at the same time. Yeah. Right. This is just a word of caution because um, there have been some studies, in particular some prop studies, with, where some quantitative parameters were estimated with wrong assumptions. And if you check the literature, there's there's hundreds, thousands of papers with prop over the years. It's forty year old, but still used a lot. It's a, has a, has had a tremendous impact, and it's still very used today. You see some of them where incorrect assumptions were made and um, led to um, some mistakes that were, had to be corrected um, later. Um, in fact, uh, I think that FRAP is still superior to photoactivation because with FRAP, you, you photo bleach, you look at the recovery, you might have some photo bleaching that you can compensate. With photoactivation, you know, things are not always as clean as we show them in the slides. You have photo, you can activate with 405 and it becomes activated, activated. But illuminating with the 488 for imaging with traditional light will also photoactivate a few molecules over time, which can also then be photo bleached as well. So with FRAP, you have to take care of photo bleaching, but with photo activation, you need to take into account also additional residual photo activation and bleaching at the same time. So, um, this provides you with a higher signal to noise at the beginning, but then over time it might be difficult to um, uh, control it all. Yes. It just occurred to me, uh, if you're saying in fact we have a partial photo uh, bleaching uh, along the vertical mm -hmm. but could we assume that a fraction, I don't know if this is the same question, I don't think so, uh, if a fraction of the full upper uh, remains in model? Yes, it could. And in a FRAP curve, you would get an immobile fraction. The recovery will not be complete if you if you normalize and if you compensate for the small amount of photo bleaching that you have just because you are imaging. Um, if you compensate for that and you still don't have a full recovery, that means that you have an immobile fraction. Part of the molecules are immobile there. You don't have a full recovery, not because you are photo bleaching a little bit while you are imaging, but because they did not go away. It's exactly to better estimate that immobile fraction, if it exists, that um, that the correction for the could be just one percent or two percent, but if you have five percent of the immobile fraction, this might give them a big deal. Um, that's why I'm calling your attention to, to that. It's it's easy to do, but to do it right, there are a lot of tiny details that we need to pay um, attention to. Oh, it's it's still I I show you all the. I show you how powerful it could be in extracting uh, uh, physical parameters, but you don't have to go, it doesn't have to be that, that difficult. I'm sorry. And I hope I should.
there's another technique to look at dynamics of molecules inside the nucleus, which I'm going to briefly mention, which is FCS, fluorescence correlation spectroscopy. In FRAP, you photo glitch a big area, a bigger area, and you look at the recovery. So you're looking at things in um, in a large area, you're looking at an average recovery. Um, in FCS, you park the laser, you focus the laser just in one spot. So we're looking at the at just a, a, a femtovolume volume of focal illumination of a single point. And we just leave the laser there and we're gonna image, we're gonna record over time the intensity captured from that spot. And we're gonna do this very, very fast. Now what happens is as molecules go inside and out, they will emit light. You'll do this very, very fast. So what you see in the fluorescent traces is, is it looks noisy, but they're uh, uh, intensity going up and down, up and down as the molecules go in and out. We can take this intensity signal over time and do a correlation curve. We compare the signal to itself at different time delays. And uh, we can generate a correlation curve like, like this. Uh, and with mathematical fitting, we can also extract a diffusion coefficient. The idea is if the molecules move slower, you will see here patterns of fluorescence that last longer, that will show a higher correlation with time. If they move fast, it's a little bit noisier. You will they'll, they'll show a lower correlation. So from the shape of the correlation curve, we can also um, um, estimate the mobility. And because we know exactly the shape of the illumination in the in the cofocal, and we know what signal to expect from molecules diffusing at different um, diffusion coefficients, we can extract also quantitative parameter in a very, very, very tiny region. One of the things that uh, people started to figure when they compared the uh, FRAP with FCS is that with FCS, you could sometimes measure much higher um, diffusion coefficients. And uh, it also found that in the nucleus, it's not really um, diffusion. It's not really just like swimming in water. There are areas where, which are more denser. There are areas where particles might be coral. So you may have anomalous diffusion. You may have constrained diffusion. They, move, they might move faster in an area and slower in others. The nuclear, the, the cells inside the cells, inside the nucleus, they are highly mobile, but they are not homogeneous in cells. So you, it's, um, um, it's a very complex, very very uh, uh, dynamic uh, behavior with a lot of, of, of detail. Um, and FCS, you can also use it to uh, quantify the dynamics in particular places, and also to look at the uh, where the proteins are interacting with themselves. I don't have a slide for that. I'm sorry, I should have one. But if you have a green and a red labeled protein, if their correlation curves are similar, that means that maybe they were diffusing or they passed through the illumination volume as a pair. Maybe they are interacting. You can also do this kind of, of experiment. Oh, good. Enough of dynamics. So just as to sum up, um, the different uh, FRAP variants and photo bleaching experiments. Um, we have, uh, I've shown you inverse FRAP. In red, I'm showing the areas that are photo bleached and in blue, um, the areas where we measure the fluorescence. We've seen night FRAP and photo activation. There's also flip fluorescence loss induced by photo bleaching, where we are continuously bleaching in one area. And we look at the loss of fluorescence elsewhere. The idea is if the molecules are traveling between these two regions, when you bleach one repeatedly, you'll see a loss of fluorescence also in the other. For instance, you have a protein that goes to the, to the nucleolide. You photo bleach one of the nucleolus. If the other is also with fluorescence, it's because the proteins are shuttling between, um, between these two organelles. There's also um, FRAP film, where you photo bleach for a long time uh, an area, and you measure the fluorescence immediately after, but in a line profile. The idea is to better measure immobile fractions. The shape of this profile will be different according to the immobile fraction that you have. So this is already a very specific uh, variant. And then, of course, FCS, which, you, um, which you have, we have talked about earlier. All right. So let's uh, leave dynamics a little. I don't know if you have any, any questions. Yeah. So you're talking about identifying um, 
maybe no. complex complexes of, of proteins uh, from mass spectrometry. Using this mass technology to the device yeah. and the uh, pressure. But now you want to sure. infer that uh, that proteins are in the electron type. Sure, absolutely. I mean you, you identify complex from mass spectrometry. They they seem to be together. When are they together? How does it happen in the cell? Are they are 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 they um are are they uh, interacting and diffusing as a complex in a region but not in, in other, you can complement that. We, I showed a little bit of this with the splicing factors. We know that they were able to, to interact in vitro. Um, mass spectrometer showed the, the, the identity of the proteins. When we label them and look in live cells, we could, just by looking at the dynamics, we could figure out that they were moving slower than they should, probably because they were interacting. So. You can see where. Yes, but to look at interactions, um, there are better techniques. I mean, we, from looking at the dynamics, we can um, we can have a glimpse, we can induce, we can assume that they are interacting. What I'm going to show you now is how we can detect protein interaction inside living cells um, with a with a with a um, with a technique that's called FRET. So the the question now is, you know, are my proteins of interest interacting with a specific part, like you are asking? Uh, you know, and where? Where is this happening? In our case, okay, we could see that they are probably binding. Where does this happen? And are they really interacting? Oh, good. Okay, so you have two proteins that you want to, that you probably guess that they are forming the diamond or part of a complex. You want to see where, if they are interacting in, in, in live cells, not just uh, uh, in in vitro um, experiments. And you go to a confocal microscope, uh, you label them with two fluorescent proteins, in this case, GFP and then Cherry, and you do a co-localization experiment, right? And if you they co-localize, they, they are interacting. I already see some problems like, which I like, um, because that's not the case, right? I mean, the, the uh, co-localization is typically shown as yellow. We can freely adjust the amount of uh, 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 Green intensity and red intensity um, on the, uh, on any on any microscope. Um, the question is, if in, even if you are able to detect them in a single um, pixel and not going super resolution here, but on a typical light of a focal, you are limited to you know the diffraction limit of like you have two hundred nanometers uh, resolution, um, and the. Uh, well, the size of the fluorescent proteins, GFP has five nanometers. It's five by four by three, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken. Three by four by four nanometers. And so the smallest thing that you can image on the microscope, your point spread function, even on a confocal microscope, if we do some quick calculations, um, it's big enough to uh, correspond to a volume where at least 42,000 G fluorescent proteins can fit. Okay, so we don't really have the resolution with localization to see if two things are interacting. Okay? It's it's the size of a football stadium. Okay, two people can be in the same stadium. It doesn't mean that they are sitting next to each other, talking to each other. They're just in a big stadium. So we cannot see protein interactions with like microscopy unless we go single molecule things like this, right? And um, but we can, and we can again thanks to quantum mechanics. <laughs> There's this, I'm going to repeat, there's this weird thing <laughs> involving quantum mechanics uh, with fluorescent dyes, which is called FRET, or fluorescence energy transfer. Uh, you know how fluorescence works. I'm not going to um, repeat um, this. Um, I'm just going to tell you that when you have two full force very close to each other, um, they both can fluoresce. They are both... Um, uh, they both absorb light at different wavelengths. Um, the first one, we call it the donor, is, ex is excited by uh, lower wavelengths, higher energy. This one is excited by blue light and it meets green light. The, the, sec the acceptor full four is excited by green light and it meets red light. Um, what happens if they are very, very close together is that uh, you excite the donor but instead of the donor emitting fluorescence, the energy of the electron in the excited state is transferred to the electron of the second fluorophore. 
there's no photon involved. There is, okay, it's not that this one emits a green photon that will be captured by this, that will just, no. It's really, it's really, it, think of them like two antennas where one of them is excited and it's quantum mechanics. In a small time, in a small space, it may happen that the energy is here and then it's there. Like Schrodinger's cat. Things like this. Then it's not. So there's this, um, there's this uh, possibility that the energy is just transferred to the second one and then the second emits light. They, this only happens in if a few conditions are met. First, they have to be really, really close, like less than 10 nanometers. This is super close. This is this is the size of the molecules themselves. Um, the, the the light, the photon that the donor would emit must, must, must match the energy that the acceptor would be excited with. So the emission spectrum of the donor must match or usually overlap with the excitation spectrum of the acceptor. Um, and then um, they also have to be um, aligned in, in space. So there's an orientation factor also to, to consider. So let me show you how this works. You have YFP, fluorescent molecule, derived from GFP. It's excited with, at peak excitation, with around 514 nanometer laser. It will emit light. Um, if you have um, an acceptor, if you have a second full four, and Cherry X as a fact threat acceptor for YFP, if they are really, really close together, what happens is that part of the energy may be transferred from the YFP to the N-Cherry, and it's the N-Cherry that emits light. Okay, so you are exciting with 514 nanometers, which excites YFP, but it's N-Cherry that's emitting. It may emit a lot of light, less light. The amount of light that's emitted, we call the threat efficiency. It depends on some factors. But um, what you see here in this example is that YFP emits much less light because part of the energy, in this case around 40% uh, or maybe more, it's the infrastructure to M-Cherry that emits light. We can precisely calculate things to force to that technique in instant. Well, what's the distance at with, with which this happens? So the distance between the donor and acceptor at which we have 50% threat efficiency is called the force statistics. Um, for CFP and YFP, for instance, is 4.92 nanometers, 5 nanometers. GFP is 4 nanometers. So they really have to be really close to, to each other. Also, look at the formula. It's very interesting. There's a fixed power there. This is really important. Why? Because it's very, very steep. So it's not the threat efficiency doesn't decline slowly with uh, with distance, okay? Um, you know, if you, we are 200 or 300 nanometers, we still have threat. No, it's, you have a, you have threat at very, very low distances. And then because of this six power dependence, it really goes down very sharply. So it's like a molecular ruler. Above 10 nanometers, there's no threat. Below 10 nanometers, we have threat. So it, it's almost an on and off. Only works if they are really, really close. And um, so, how can we take advantage of it? How do we see threat on a, on a microscope? There are tons of ways of looking at threat. You can measure changes in the intensity of either the donor or the acceptor. You can you can look at just the acceptor alone, looking at intensity or the lifetime. I told you that the electron in the excited state spends a few nanoseconds there. We can actually measure that. I'm going to show you how. Um, we can uh, monitor changes in, in the, also in the donor uh, uh, fluorescence, also intensity and lifetime, also uh, in the orientation in the anisotropy. We can um, not going to go um, uh, into that, but we can also look at the polarization of light and understand whether we have a threat or not. I'm going to show you three techniques um, that you can use to look at threat. Sensitized emission, uh, except for photo bleaching and you know, fluorescent um, lifetime. Right. So first, mention um, tell you about how how do you know whether um, two proteins would be a threat pair or not? There's a huge list. It's grow. It's a growing list. Um, there's a there's a fantastic uh, site uh, FP base where you can check the uh, uh, the properties of fluorescent proteins. Um, that was developed by, by um, Tolerby. Um, it also has a, a threat calculator. So you can tell, um, you, can, you can specify which are the donor and accept the molecules, and it will calculate 
um, what's the threat efficiency, it will tell you what's, what will be the first radius. So we can check whether your two proteins, besides having overlapping emission and excitation, uh, whether they would be a good threat pair um, of, of, of not or not. So probably the first attempt at doing threat was to see, well, let's see if we let's see if we do if we can see threat directly. Let's excite the donor and see if the acceptor emits, right? This is probably the obvious way. So um, the, using CFP and YFP, let's excite the uh, CFP with the violet light, and let's see if the YFP uh, emits. Um, okay, so if we see yellow light coming from YFP when we excite the violet, it's because we have threat. Right, this is the direct way to see threat. And then, um, yeah, if it would be so easy, but. <laughs> It's not because, uh, and it's not because the resonant dyes have a very large uh, spectrum, emission and excitation spectrum, right? So um, one of the things that can happen is when you excite with 405, uh, CFP will emit, yes. And if we use a fluorescent microscope with a filter for YFP here in the 550 nanometers, sure, we will detect YFP, but we also detect a little bit of CFP emission. So because the emission spectrum of the donor is quite um, uh, quite, quite large, it, it goes all the way to the, um, uh, to, to the infrared a little bit, part of the light that we capture is actually emission from the donor. It's not emission from, uh, from the acceptor. So there's a problem there. Also, we can have direct YFP excitation. In the same way, I mean, YFP is mostly excited with 540 nanometers. But the 405 violet laser will also excite it a little bit, maybe 5%, but it will emit light. So um, if you if if your proteins are close, but if your threat efficiency is not really high, the signal that you are detecting. Technique, you need to do controls. You need to image with your um, uh, thread filter. So you could have a filter set on the microscope with a, an excitation filter for the donor and emission filter for the specter. You call this a thread filter set. You need to image cells expressing just the donor and just the, the, the acceptor and measure what is the uh, emission of the donor or the direct excitation of the acceptor. Um, this is almost like wind compensation in cytology. You need to calculate what's the weak through to the, to the threat channel from the donor and the acceptor. And your real threat signal will come from the um, subtraction of the threat signal that you are imaging of the direct um, acceptor excitation and the donor weak through. So you can do this, this can be done, but unless you have a very strong threat signal, um, the, this, this, uh, uh, this correction, this normalization, will lead to noisy data. So this is the direct way to do threat, but it's not a very easy way to do to do threat. Okay. So let's look at an alternative, which you can do on the confocal um, microscope, which is called acceptor photo bleaching threat. So here the idea is that you know let's go back to YFP and M Sherry. You excite YFP if uh, M Sherry is very, very close because they are linked to two proteins that are interacting. And part of the light will be emitted by a cherry because of the energy transfer between both of them. Um, okay, so how are we going to detect threat? Let's, let's get a photo bleaching to our advantage. What we are going to do now is we take an image of donor and acceptor uh, with donor excitation. And now we are going to photo bleach and cherry, just and cherry. And Cherry has a peak excitation at 594 or 561, but we can use one of these lasers to uh, remove that electron, that electron from the M Cherry. It's going to be lost. It cannot fluoresce any longer. It cannot um, receive the energy transfer from the donor again. So M Cherry is dark because it's still there. We are still interacting. Everything is fine, but this one does not fluoresce anymore. So the energy cannot be transferred. If it cannot be transferred, what will happen to the donor? It will emit as if it was alone. So we'll see an increase in the intensity of the of the donor. And let me show you an example. So these are 
our splicing factor that we labeled with um, donor and acceptor YFP and M cherry. We are going to photo bleach the acceptor in part of the cell. You see here an increase in the intensity of the donor. They were interacting. In that area, we had threat. And the advantage of using this technique is that we can just, by comparing the intensity of the donor before and after photo bleaching the acceptor, we can directly calculate the threat um, efficiency. Uh, we can generate a threat efficiency map, which we can then overlap with the original image. So we get a special map of where these interactions are occurring. In the focal microscope, it, looking at interactions of proteins that are five nanometers close to each other. And so, um, but there's a problem. There's, there's, there's a catch what, can you tell me what it is? So yes. I just showed you that these splicing factors are highly dynamic, right? Um, and so this could also be a prop experiment. Uh, in order to do this, I either I just use the first image, or if I continue imaging over time, they will redistribute. So this was actually done in fixed cells to be able to get this special mapping. This was done in fixed cells. It can also be done in live cells. We can photo bleach the acceptor in the whole cell or in the whole nucleus and use the nearby cell to look at the to compare the intensities. Okay. So what did we learn with our splicing factors? We learned, we saw with except the photo bleaching threat that indeed they are interacting. We could see the different components of the spliceosome, uh, the early components of the spliceosome that we saw in the FRAP studies interacting um, even when the splicing was not occurring. So here we didn't have any new mRNAs being transcribed and still they were interacting and still they were forming uh, complexes. When we abolished their ability to interact with each other, we saw no threat signal. So, um, this was a confirmation from the uh, hypothesis that we had with the FRAP uh, experiments that you know the mobility is lower because they are indeed interacting with each other. The weird thing was that they were doing so even when no new RNA was being formed. So um, this was strongly arguing against the recruitment, step-by-step -step recruitment of the, of the splicing factors. Okay, there's another technique to look at threat. Which is actually much better than all the previous ones, and it's the gold standard of threat assessment, which is to um, quantify, to measure the amount of time that the four forests spend in the excited state, the lifetime of the donor. And uh, this tells us this tells where the threat is occurring or not, because you know when you have fluorescence, um, you may have a lifetime of a few nanoseconds or five nanoseconds. But when you have threat, the energy is transferred to the acceptor, uh, which means uh, uh, that you have an additional um, uh, an additional process there that will uh, make the lifetime shorter. Okay, the fluorescence will will not last as long as it usually does on threat because before it has time to emit the photon, it will transfer the energy to the acceptor, and so the lifetime of the donor. The lifetime of the donor when it's undergoing threat is shorter than when the donor is alone. If we can measure the lifetime, we can see whether we have threat occurring or, or not. Okay, so how do we measure the lifetime? Two ways. We can do it in the so-called um, time domain, where we use pulse lasers and we actually directly measure the time that the photons take to be emitted and we um, uh, uh, and we um, get extracted and calculated from uh, an emission curve of many many photons over um, over time or we do it in the frequency domain in which we use a modulated light source where the intensity is changing like this the emission will also um, be modulated but with a different amplitude and phase because of the lifetime uh, of the full four. And from these two curves, we can also extract the lifetime. So the big advantage and the reason why I told you that this is the gold standard of uh, 
a threat is because a person's lifetime determination are independent of the flow for concentration. Okay, you can have areas with a bright, um, with a high concentration, bright signal, low signal, the lifetime will not be changed by that. And it will also not depend on the light path or orientation of the microscope. The lifetime of a flow for is the same in different um, uh, in different microscopes. It, you can do the experiment um, uh, in, in different systems. So uh, by um, in the time domain, you can measure the lifetime by using, as I said, not a continuous wave laser, not one that's always in photons, but the pulse laser. There's a pulse of light and another and another and another, like in the multiphoton uh, microscope. And your detector must be fast enough so that you can measure the time in picoseconds between the emission of the laser pulse and the detect and the arrival of the first photon. So you detect the first photon after, let's say, um, three nanoseconds, then another one after four nanoseconds. You do this for many, 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 many photons. It's a Poisson process. They will not be emitted always with the same lifetime. So what you have is a, is a distribution of uh, arrival times of photons at your detector to which you can fit an exponential curve and get a lifetime. This is how it's done. So you need to collect a lot. You just you don't just measure one photon. You measure thousands of them, tens of thousands, and you get um, curves like this, with which you can fit um, exponential. If you have a single lifetime, you'll have a single exponential, and you can directly extract a lifetime. Two nanoseconds, two point eight nanoseconds. Okay. So this requires pulse lasers. Detectors that can do time correlated single photon selfie. Not, um, uh, it's not as accessible, you probably need an extra equipment besides your photo um, and microscope. The other, um, the other uh, variant that I told you about is frequency domain flip. So, like I told you, you can excite uh, with a modulated um, light source. Okay, you have a uh, you can have a pocket cells that changes the intensity of light uh, with with time. These are also using multiphotons, and you can change the you can change the the transmission of it. You can change it with time with, uh, according to a very periodic and predictable uh, pattern. And the light that's emitted by the sample will also be modulated in time and space. But like I told you, it will have a difference in phase because of the lifetime, but also in amplitude. And you can extract. Um, I'm showing you the formulas there. You can expect a lifetime, either through the phase or through the amplitude, but you can expect a lifetime of your uh, donor flow force. So this is the one that I, I, I did at, um, at Douglas Gardella Lab at, at Amsterdam. Um, this has the advantage that it's much, much faster. You don't have to acquire a lot of images to be counting the photons. You can just use a, a, a wide field um, system with modulated light and you get the light a lifetime. And, um, what you see here are you know, high numerical aperture, wide field images with low um, resolution and some blur, but we could measure the lifetime um, in the whole, um, in this case, the nucleus of the cell for our splicing factors. And what you can see is that this is the, the donor um, alone, CFP, bound to one of the splicing factors. It has a lifetime of 2.3 nanoseconds or 2.9, the very in modulation, the values are slightly different if you use the phase or the or the or the amplitude. But what you can see when we add the acceptor um, led bound to the uh, U2AF65, which is the partner of U2AF35 in the splice system, you see that the lifetime comes down. So there's threat between these two because the lifetime of the donor can comes down. So what we did, we accept the photo bleaching, we replicated with fluorescence lifetime um, imaging microscopy, and we could see that uh, the interactions that we are detecting in fixed cells, we could also see in live cells uh, with, with flame, and that the nucleus and that the splicing factors that were in the nucleus were interacting uh, with each other all over the nucleus in the places where they were more concentrated or less concentrated. Um, even with in the absence of nascent RNA. So even without RNA, it would just form. And uh, what we proposed at the time was that, you know, as many, many other machines in the cell, it's not just that they are dynamic, 
also the old views that things would work in a clock like clock like yeah. manner that he's putting will be put it and another then another who's reporting him what's the timing things don't happen that way in the cell they instead of a stable instead structuring equilibrium where you know the architecture determines a function and you need dedicated machines to build the puzzle instead what we had were very dynamic structures where the pieces of the puzzle will bind to each other if they found each other they will, the splice system was already forming and if it found an RNA it will bind it and complete the sequence if not it might disassemble or but but these these fluctuations and these interactions provided the cell with a much more flexible um, uh, um, uh, machine with which complex mechanisms could still occur but in a much more dynamic dynamic way so everything was more self-organized rather than self-assembled um, for the spliceosome and others have shown that this is also the case for other molecular machines um, in the cell okay we're almost done i'm just going to leave you with an advice if you want to do spread um and you have a spread there and you check at the base and they overlap tremendous signal unless you're really lucky um you uh, you should take the time or the efforts to label your proteins of interest both in the c terminus and in the n terminus and i'm showing you here uh, the reason why this must happen we found in our studies that u2af65 one of these proteins was also able to bind with itself to form homodimers um, uh, which was something new, but we could only detect this interaction when we had the donor and the acceptor both in the C terminus of the protein, not one in the N terminus and, and the other one in the C, and not both in the C. Why is that? They are always forming the homodimer. But remember that it's not the proteins that must be together; it's the pool force. Okay, so uh, perhaps the interaction domain is on the C terminus. If we put the pool four there, they cannot; they may not interact. Sure, but maybe they still do. Maybe the interaction domain is more in the middle. Maybe you know they bind like this. This is the N terminus. This is this is the C terminus. And if they are in the N terminus, they are five nanometers apart. They're very very close. Maybe in the C terminus in the same protein, but they are maybe probably twelve nanometers or fifteen nanometers apart. You no longer detect an interaction. So absence of threat does not mean that you do not have an interaction. They might still, they might be, you know, glued together, but the full force themselves are further than 10 nanometers apart. So threat with antibodies, with resin to label antibodies can be tricky. The size of the antibodies themselves could bring the full force further apart than the actual uh, epitopes that you're um, labeling. But if you do see a threat signal, then um, you uh, are most likely looking at molecular um, uh, interaction. That's it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Yes. Well, well, threatening is like the there are the children. Can I use that multiple pairs? I don't know if that's the question. Yeah, we tried that for a long time to um, to have uh, two pairs of threads, like donor acceptor, the acceptor would be then the donor for the yeah, other. Right. Yeah, we tried that. Um, it 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 seems that it's it could be possible. Now there's wonderful developments in the world of, 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 of probes. Actually, from the also from the University of, of, of Amsterdam, where where I, I was, uh, they are they are developing new um, uh, fluorescent probes with huge brightness, very long. Uh, um, very long lifetimes, which can be used to detect uh, that, uh, let's say, uh, uh, cascade of, of, of interaction. It's very hard to detect the second, the second one. You need, you need the first one. Besides the, besides the special arrangement, they really must be very close to to, to each other. Um, the the amount of photons that you need from the the final acceptor um, and its effect on the donor was always limited. You could never uh, we could never do it, and I'm, not, and I'm not aware of, of it ever being done. There might be something that I missed, but I have not seen it done. But the good news is that with the new developments in all these uh, fantastic present probes that are appearing, optimized also for uh, for threat. With you know, with the um, with a huge quantum yield, with a very long uh, uh, lifetime, so increasing the force of it, maybe. Uh, it's 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 becoming possible. That would be really uh, great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.
uh, for instance, if I want to be in a science science free channel, then I have to use two of them, and I also I only want to buy the first one of there. I can use also either so that I can sure. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, with the third one, with the third one, you would not have the same special information. You would just no, you with the third one, we you could tell that it was in the two hundred nanometer range, not in the five nanometer. Sure, you can you can combine this with multi-parametric image of other full force, but for the for the for the third, you need the you need the third. Yeah. yeah. I was thinking about membrane binding for operons. Um, would they interact, or is it bigger distance? Not sure if I follow the question. So you you labeling membrane components with the uh, operons. Explain itself. I'm talking about bacteria. Bacteria, and so you have. Because you have uh, uh, a you have proper that binds to. Uh, membranes that are um, intact, mm -hmm. and then you have uh, another proper device to bacteria that are uh, that have uh, compromised membrane. Um, I was wondering if the threat uh, could could have a negative impact on the energy. Meaning that you would be. Um, I'm not. Sorry, I'm not sure if I get this. So uh, that you would have uh, two different full form. You could probably image one, but you'd be imaging uh, less emission because it was spreading. Uh, it was spreading yeah. damage to the second thing like this. Could that happen? In that scenario? Yes, and it could also happen in other scenarios like single molecule um, imaging. If you're imaging. Single full for and, and doing single molecule microscopy, mm -hmm. if they are very, very, very uh, uh, close together, you could actually be losing some photons because of energy transfer to nearby full for. But, you know, um, for the question that you are asking, that would really be an extreme scenario where everything would be threatened with a nearby full for to the point that you would not be able to image the donor. So we're talking about. Uh, pretty efficiently close to 90, 100 percent. That's that, that's not likely. To, uh, okay. Another application that I did not show that you can use thread for is in the same molecule. So you could have the same molecule with donor and acceptor, which shows no thread signal, and then it changes conformation in some biological process, and then all the donor and acceptor become close to each other, and then you have thread. So you can also do this. Uh, you can also use thread pairs labeling the same molecule to detect conformational change. I haven't shown that, but can also, that can also be done. But in, to affect imaging, I would say that uh, okay, we probably can complement it, but only, only if you go really single molecule, like four or five nanometers, I'm talking about nucleus and things like this, you can have maybe a resonance transfer affecting the the localization, the localization of your full force, because you'll be detecting from nearby full force instead of the, of, of the one that, that you wanted to other than that, you'd be limiting what you do at all. Mm -hmm. That's right. You have to really push it in order to do the scope. It would be, it could happen, but it would have to be very very Okay. So my question regarding PrEP. Mm -hmm. Can you couple PrEP or use PrEP uh, to study the regeneration of uh, an organ to damage, for example? And can you couple the photo bleaching radiation to radiation that will cause that damage in the organ? Uh, sure. To, to contextualize a bit, I work with nanoparticles mm -hmm. that accumulate them and it takes a uh, small um, small time the um, excitement of the nanoparticle because in a certain wavelength I could heat them up and cause organal damage. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking if I could um, couple that wavelength with the photo bleaching wavelength of a certain fluorophore mm -hmm. and achieve and visualize the recovery of the damage or the permanent damage through crap. Sure, you can. Um, I mean, you can. Um, the idea would be to use the same, if I get this right, so you use the same. Uh, irradiation the same wavelength to both damage and bleach, so you could get the dynamics. Sure, I mean, uh, 
Um, you can use a 405 a violent laser to induce DNA damage. And if you have a, 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 a DNA repair protein label with the CFE, you'll be photo bleaching at the same time. So you could then look at the difficulty to produce things like it. And typically, uh, when you're talking about damaging, those are usually much uh, higher, uh, laser power, much higher intensities than the ones required for photo bleaching. Um, I mean, it, sometimes we, we bleach with 100% laser transmission, but sometimes we don't need that much. It really depends on, yeah, sure, but I, I, I don't see why it would be a problem. You'd be combining both and you would photo bleach or you would see the, the, the recovery. That could be, or you could, you know, you could, uh, you could combine uh, different wavelengths, one for um, damaging, the other one for photoactivating um, in a different wavelength, and you could still do the recovery. Uh, you could still get the dynamics. Um, yeah, I mean, if if, um, if you want to try something something out in that area, I mean, it's interesting. <laughs> uh, we can talk sure that we do that in front. Any other questions? Okay, thank you.